Oh, we're back, everyone. Hello, welcome back to the uh, Zoltac Cross LSA um, little collaboration review streams. Um, today, we're covering and finishing up with the top 10 from Zoltac 2023. And uh, for those of you that have been paying attention to the posts, you'll know today I'm being joined by uh, Ben Butzabaker from Eclipse. How you going, mate? Very well, mate. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. And Runt making a yet another appearance on uh, on the LSA thing. Welcome back, mate. How are you? Yeah, good to be back. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Um, chat, for those of you that are there, hello. Let us know if the audio level's okay. I know last last stream I kind of neglected that and then, you know, everyone was different volumes. I was quiet as a mouse. Axiom was like a booming voice. So let us know if uh, anyone's particularly loud or quiet or if the music's too loud or quiet as well. But um, anyway, uh, just a, a bit of a disclaimer, I guess. Um, for those of you that have been maybe watching the previous streams, you'll know that the bottom 10 one went for three and a half hours and the second one went for two and a half hours. So, you know, we're averaging three hours, but realistically we could end up going over that. So you know buckle in for a potentially a pretty long one but um it's going to be a good timer regardless you gents ready ready as i'll ever be mate no worries cool 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 all righty uh let me get myself yep fantastic um i'm gonna share my screen <laughs> that'll help okay boom there he is so, Run, you've prepared a couple graphics for us. I would like you to just explain to the people in the chat what we're looking at. And there's going to be another one after this as well. But... Yeah, cool. So I got the help of Twinkles to pull some data for me because I had this question of where are teams actually getting their points at what stage in the game? So this, what you're looking at is essentially the average worm for Cascade 1, Cascade 2, and Ascensions of each team in the top 10. So this essentially says at what stage they're getting their points. When it starts to plateau, they're like getting less points. When they're getting more points, it goes up. Um, but yeah, if we go to the next slide, you'll actually be able to see this in some more detail. So this is the same thing, but it's just removed all the blank space. So the team with the lowest average score is going to be at the bottom of plateaued at zero. Um, but as teams gain points, their line goes up. So that's them not just gaining points, but increasing their lead on other teams. When the line plateaus, that means they're kind of maintaining their position in the game. So they're maintaining with the other teams if the line's relatively flat. And if the line's going down, they're losing ground. So other teams are catching up to them and their points are slowing down throughout the game. So yeah, uh, what what do you guys say that's interesting from this graph? Oh, when I saw we've only just seen this in the last twenty minutes, but straight away we were I was like, oh my god, that's very cool information uh, we haven't seen before. Um, but my first kind of when I first saw it, I thought, okay, so what would you want to see as a team captain or a leader on your team? And for me, I would want to see um, a, a good start, like good first or two minute or two, um, because that's typically in the in the tougher games when there's that lockdown play everybody's trying to win the field point game so if you're doing well in that part of the game then you should have a pretty good start um, and then the end game as well like the second half of the game when the game is won um, you know that demonstrates that you're making good decisions at the midpoint um, and adjusting and executing essentially so if you ignore your uh, the Vikings um, <laughs> graph which is that's like irrelevant here because it's just that's just <laughs> complete domination um, it, it is a bit interesting in the fact that we are we do plateau at the end uh and we go slightly down so i think i'm relatively happy with that though the fact that other teams aren't really catching up even once our heavy hitters are done i'm pretty happy with just maintaining our lead like that's that's not too bad for me um if we were going down that's when i'd start to worry yeah totally I saw when you play when all us me immortals that are down in the rest of the group, <laughs> the rest of the pack. Um, I, I looked at um, I looked at the Spartans worm. I thought, oh, that's that's the pretty worm because they've got that nice first minute or two, um, and then it's the midpoint after six minutes they kind of they kind of head up. So that's what I kind of saw when I first looked at it. How about you, Holmesy? Yeah, I saw um, 
there's like, you know, the, the first minute was the only time where someone was on average doing better than the Vikings. So oh, kudos true. to the Cobras for <laughs> to pulling that off. Well, Outside Cobras. of that, you know, they got that, they got that little, little slip there. Um, no one else could, uh, could do it. But, um, no, I think it's, um, it's actually a really cool graph because I looked at like the Aftershock one, for instance, and then we'll obviously talk about more about these teams in depth and we'll might refer back to these graphs, but, um, uh we usually once we got to the halfway point of a game we would start to like drop off a bit and we would i don't know stop pushing the pace of the game or we would like struggle like you know teams would make adjustments and maybe we wouldn't adjust well enough whatever it is but it was something we noticed like we could have like the best start ever um you know in the first two minutes and you can see that in our graph like on average we did have really really strong starts but then sometimes we just um not all the time but we did struggle overall with the the middle part of the game yeah because um, because you guys are like the third best team in the first four minutes of the game but then it just starts to drop and by that 10 minute mark you guys are actually the lowest average scoring team at 10 minutes yeah. in the game so there's a really interesting thing happening within that midsection of the game that aftershock yeah it really needs yeah. to look at it, it does claw back at the end though you guys clearly get your last second bases which clutch up for you guys yeah 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 it's um it's just interesting that the, the, the graph actually seems to reflect without delving into it too deep what the games felt like mm, more often than not, which I which I thought was really cool. Um, other than that, um, um, no, just sick. Yeah, Thank you for my one, for us. Yeah. My one to point out would be Archangels. I found them really interesting because they actually did pretty, pretty like um, a very slow start, four minutes it's literally that three to four minutes that's a huge spike like one of the biggest spikes there they always get a base at that three minute mark um so that's interesting and then pretty solid throughout the mid game but then those last few minutes especially those last two minutes they full just nose dive like that is them dropping what they were so far ahead of storm average points on dropping so far below them in the last two minutes of the game so they are actively like consistently getting denied or just getting railed in those past in those last two minutes which to me was fascinating uh, it, it it makes sense but yeah they i think you saw a lot of games where it had flipped those last two minutes and it just always denies by the looks yeah yeah cool well um you know we might refer back to this as we go but um otherwise are we ready to start talking about our uh about our teams i think so Let's do it yeah yeah Cool, cool. And uh, speaking of, starting off, we have uh, the Hobart Archangels. We had Easy Points, Mantis, Jellyhawk, Sega, Shiri Kitty, and Villain. Um, that was a sloppy transition. My bad, guys. Next one <laughs> will be better. Um, right. You warmed up now, mate. I'm warmed up. So the Hobart Archangels were predicted ninth place, and they finished in tenth. So they were down one on their predictions, and those predictions are the final Laser Sports Academy predictions, not the not the sinksless ones. Just for um, just so you know. But um, yeah, run. Why don't you get us uh, you know, on the topic of Archangels to tell us a little bit about about um how the Archangels played, what they did well, and uh, maybe some things they didn't do so well. Maybe that last few minutes of the game. Um, so this team, kind of like what I was saying with Cerberus, it was quite interesting in the fact that normally home side teams, especially those uh, like not the strongest Hobart um, home side teams, often very strong start and it just gets worse and worse as other teams start to adjust and start to catch up. Uh, so usually when you're a home side team, it's just a game of trying to maintain that lead throughout the comp. What uh, it was especially interesting and impressive, I thought, from Hobart teams was that wasn't really happening. So they had a relatively weak start, and then uh, like this is just a pretty standard um, run of like a maybe somewhat inconsistent team where you sort of start maybe worse than you should. You get cascades, get slapped around a little bit, but then you sort of level off where you, where you started, where you're meant to be. Um, but yeah, that kind of shows to me that they're adapting as other teams are. Um, and a lot of the strength might not have been as much home site as people were perhaps predicting throughout the first few pre-nets. So yeah, pretty happy with where those guys ended up. Um, top 10, that they, they could have maybe pushed a bit higher, but they would have struggled uh, with just the sheer pack skill that they yeah. had so and i think it's an interesting point you made 
I said this as well when we were talking about Cerberus in the, the previous stream, where I said pretty much like the same thing. I was <laughs> like, typically when you've got your, uh, your, your home site teams, they'll start super strong and then they'll tend to just taper off as the comp goes, as they're like, their home site advantage like wears off because the other teams are like catching up in, the, in that sense. But um, Hobart Cerberus did the same thing where like, well, they were less up and down. They were, I'm pretty sure they started <laughs> yeah. where they did and they just went, Climbed up. I just feel sad to, yeah. So that was that's just like you know I think it's a, a really really cool to see a breaking of the the mold so to speak, um, and then obviously you guys just decide to stay on top for the whole thing. But we'll get to you guys. <laughs> right the end. Um, yeah. Well, um, Butza, did you versus the Archangels much, and did you notice much about um, you know, strategically how they played and things they did well? Yeah. So um, just on that thing with them starting quite low and finishing high if you actually like the round robin um ladder between sixth and twelfth there was only four points oh, so damn. there was actually yeah there was actually just they were just amongst a big group of teams that were all around the same level um and if even if you look at the cascade one they were only a couple hundred points like 600 points on average from like being three spots lower so which would have been their final finishing position so uh, it's might have been is a little bit it looks like they started really poorly and went really great but it was actually like just a couple of little results really that were making four or five spot variations on the ladder um and that was what was happening to the group of teams um that was probably from about six to about 12 they were all about that level um in terms of what i saw in in there um i think that graph that you showed before right was like really insightful um i feel like just the lack of experience probably cost them in closing games out like they had they knew how to play the arena uh, really well. Um, they had some real weapons on their team, like Jellyhawk getting a 1.43 tag ratio. <sighs> My God, he must Crazy. have been up in the top couple of players for the tournament. That was that was incredible. Um, and all the rest Very of them are around one. So you got 0 0.98, 0 0.93, 0 0.98, 107, and 0.97. So in terms of a team tag ratio, that's pretty up there. Like there's other top 10 teams that have got something similar. They don't have a 1.43, but something similar <laughs> um but what i felt was just missing was the um decision making in the second half of the game um the experience of the other top 10 competitors because when we start talking about the other teams in the top 10 there's a lot of experience in there um all the way through um yeah that was just getting the better of them and yeah as we saw on the final day some of those games were so close you only need to make a couple of micro decisions not quite at the level and um you will lose a game by a base or something like that so yeah, that was possibly the biggest thing I noticed, but super difficult team to play um, and performed amazingly well in their first nats. They should be really proud of themselves overall. Yeah. Um, this is no. the second nats, if I'm not wrong, but yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't go to the last one. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, <laughs> I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the slap. <laughs> it, it makes a lot of sense uh, what you're saying about like more experienced teams. Like they clearly were quite good at opening the game in that sort of more defensive structure uh, with that structure that they've sort of practiced more, which is quite similar to how we open games. Uh, um, but when the game actually opens up and teams start to break away with bases and stuff, it's playing that sort of more chaotic game that I think these guys might are, are, are a lot weaker in. It's when you switch to your two and your three man, your, your, your dumps, uh, all that sort of stuff, right? towards the end of the game, which is where people are going to be in different positions throughout the game. The game is more dynamic, more complex, and that's where your less experienced players are going to struggle when the game is more complex um, and when you can't play throughout habit as much. So yeah, yeah when you play a home maze, you, you, you've got a lot of things that you know will happen here and here and here, but when the game opens up more, it's less of those things happening. It's less predictable, so you got to more think on the fly and adapt to that um yeah something else yeah it the stat spread for this team is quite even um i think we've sort of always said that archangel is quite a well balanced team which is quite a good thing um all their players while some may be stronger attackers a lot of the time they make up for it by being stronger defenders and it, it looks like that with the stats with the exception of jelly of course who Everyone would finally see is what I was, I've been hyping up from like literally <laughs> last year. Um, I told you all. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's, it's quite a well balanced team with all the players relatively on par. So hopefully they all develop at the same pace, which is like what I think we saw them doing throughout the competition, sort of catching other teams up as other teams are learning and they're learning with them, which is what you really want to see from your team. So pretty happy with where these guys are at. 
Yeah, yeah, cool. On the topic of Jelly Hawk, he had the fourth highest tag ratio behind Whippet, then Runt, and then Husky. So um, definitely a... I mean, this was Jelly Hawk's first Nationals, I believe. I don't think he was in Bendigo. So for your first Nationals and to be uh, in the... Had the fourth highest tag ratio of the entire tournament. And also having a super impressive base stat as well. It's not like the guy was just like locked in his base for 12 minutes and then, yeah. you know, he was cracker at that. But then, you know, maybe the rest of his skill set wasn't well developed. He obviously uh, was pretty well-rounded in in that, you know, 1.31 is like one of the higher base stats. Um, so, yeah, very impressive. Yeah, it, it's quite interesting because he'd often, I think, start off as anchor and then just get his bases quite quickly and by the looks relatively cleanly and then just go back to anchoring which is good for your stats but it's bloody hard to, to be an anchor player and be so proficient in just getting a quick base and then dipping back to anchor but yeah i guess it's uh, one of those things where like theoretically when you think about it the skills as a last line yeah um, <laughs> should be very similar to the skills of an attacker specifically once you've gotten into the base right it's the same skill set like you're holding usually holding the same position you would as a last line you're just adding also shooting a base into it um obviously the tricky bit <clears throat> is usually getting in the base yeah. um but um no it kind of it, it makes sense that a last line like a really strong last line would be good at not getting denied very much because they are so confident and comfy in those bases. Um, no, nah, very, very, very good point spread from uh, Mr. Jellyhawk. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, maybe the some of the some more of the weaknesses that maybe held this team back from from climbing higher. Runt, have you got any any insights on that? Um. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. I, I only versed these guys once at Nationals, um, so it'll be more of kind of a lot of personal stuff that I obviously know about the players and a lot of what I was saying at Prenas too. And yeah, really that closing out of games, I think a lot of the time these guys panic and uh, get a bit heated and just sink shots into bases at the end of the game, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think they had a, a strong opening, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough to say too much without actually what, being able to watch too many of their games. Um, I think that, I think that I have probably have some stuff to, for them to improve on, but in terms of base cracking, I think they maybe need to make the move earlier and be a bit more aggressive, aggressive with those pushes because we know they can pack point, but I think a lot of the time this team's pack points were down as well. So I think trust the trust and push out a bit more. Like they know they should know how to. But yeah, I think um. Now that you mentioned that, I remember <clears throat> versing them um, a couple times at nationals, and so I would be in a, I'd be playing a position where I'm kind of like a fourth defender, but I had the freedom to, you know, make runs at a base and stuff to really pull the pull the floaters and the defense back. And I think something I remember noticing with the Archangels is um, their crunch was really good. Um, but the time it would take them to then like break, like okay, like okay, no one's here, let's push mm. up again. That was um, seemed almost like timid in a way, um, yeah. a little bit timid and you know a little bit slow. And it's one of those things where even if it's a difference of like running to that build point spot like super quick versus like you know very carefully walking there, that could be the difference of depending on how big the arena is. You know, a handful of seconds, and in a handful of seconds, you could you could be getting like, you know, you, you, there's any a number of opportunities to get tags that you could have missed out on, right? So I think, um, yeah, that'd be something I I noticed now that you bring it up is just it was easy to they start to float out, and then you just sprint at their base, go right up to the door, take a death, you know, maybe take a double with someone, and then like reset, and then it will take them a while to then spread out again, which is um, you know, it's it's an effective way of dealing with floaty teams that are trying to rely on their field points it's like well you can send one person there to just take a death every now and then and their whole team crunches back right so yeah baker did you notice anything or butza uh yeah i guess just to add to what you guys said i think the number one thing is what you've already said um rant about uh the, the second half game stuff uh that's the single biggest thing they could do to improve their game is that but if there was one more thing i think uh when we looked at the graph earlier and they had a good early to mid game um keeping in mind that was at home um is that going to stand up next year away from home um and if there's 
when I looked at the, all of the top 10 teams, actually, I looked at the top four um, and I was like, okay, they clearly have no holes in their list of players. Um, but outside of the top four, every team that there was, you could argue that was, oh, okay, they could beat themselves up as a in last line or another main attacker. Or there was somewhere on their list where they could beat themselves up. And I just feel like Hobart Archangels could probably look at having one more in this particular arena, I felt like you needed two weapon players. Like you guys had, you had Runt and Twinkles. You had two people going out, getting their 50 tags, averaging 9, 10K, except for if you're on Vikings and it's 13, 14K. <laughs> um, and that was the, what Archangels probably were lacking, um, mm. is that second player. Um, your Jelly's averaging nine, and then down from there, we've got seven, six, or oh, you got seven at Sagers on seven, eight. So you, they could probably do with one more player to step up to, to be the, the Twinkles on the team, so to speak. Um, and that will that will give them more options in late game because that would theoretically puts you in a better position at mid game to have better choices to make at the mid game. So probably one little little thing I noticed. Yeah, yeah, no, because um, I, I I think um, these are also quite static players. Is something we've been trying to push, and I think a lot of these players would be capable of having like that that one tag ratio, that sort of higher. In, more in the pack, m more pushing straight back to your position if they're a bit less, <laughs> yeah, a bit more active. Um, so I, that, that's one thing I, I'd want, that's my main improvement I'd want to see from the team is more activity, um, really working harder for every kill and all pushing those pack points as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, um, let's pick a, let's each of us pick a standout player of the team. Um, Runt, I'll let you go first. I mean, obviously, Jelly. Yeah. <laughs> kind of hard. It's kind of... I try to avoid being the, uh, the uh, you know, just the obvious pick. You know, yeah. oh, this guy's got good stats, but I mean, the stats are super impressive. No, and especially knowing that he played mo mainly a last line position and to have a base stat as good as he did and a denials against stat as clean as he did. Um, super, super cool. Um, and you know, like his denials four aren't very, aren't very high, but realistically, like your last line shouldn't be getting very many denials <laughs> because they're the last one to get shot before the base goes down. Right. Um, so, you know, I, you can't re you really can't bag on any of those, any of those stats. And I mean, anecdotally, obviously he did extremely well. So, but so you're gonna, you're gonna mirror that one. No, I'm going to shout out to uh, Shuri Kitty. Um, I just was, she impressed the hell out of me. Um, both playing against her and also refing her. Um, she just makes really good decisions. And she got come out with a tag ratio of 0.97. That's pretty incredible. Um, in that area of the ladder to get an almost one tag ratio is quite difficult. Uh, and she's nowhere near a skill cap yet. Like she's got lots of improvement yeah. left in her. So um, she's going to be one to watch out for in the future, big time um, in women's events and teams events. Uh, so, and she also was the one who denied you when we had when we played doubles and you had the empty red mate, and she got around That's me. That's true. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I had I had the drop, and she was too short, and she got under my laser, um, and she knew exactly what she was doing as well. She knew exactly how to get around me. Um, yep, and she denied you, and I didn't say anything because I was hoping you'd get the last shot in. So there you go. I have to shout her out for that. Yeah, you've just, always been... you've just evoked a, a memory that I purged <laughs> and suppressed. Oh, goodness. I will never get, never get over this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, she, she's always been a very impressive player, but it often hasn't translated through with, like, stats or scores. But I think this is the first comp competition where we've, like, actually seen her pulling those big scores and, like, putting it all together and actually seeing the results of, like, that decision-making, which, yeah, I think is the strongest asset. <sighs> Anyway, um, you've caused me pain, physical pain. I've thrown, I've thrown off our host. I've thrown him, I've thrown him <laughs> in the bin here. Is somebody else there to take over? Maybe. <laughs> Calling out for an LSA host. Is anybody out there? <laughs> We're taking applications. Someone in the chat can just jump in. No, I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm not crying. You're crying. All right. <laughs> um, so to wrap up our um, conversation around the Hobart Archangels, um, you know, we've said it a couple times, but it seems like the main takeaway for them, assuming that the team, the, the team sticks to, together in, in some kind of a form for, from this nationals moving into next nationals is maybe, um, bumping up the, a bit of that factor, you know, which you, you, you really, especially once you're getting to the pointy ends of the tournament, like it's, 
I think you need to have a little bit of of that because you know you come against someone that does have that like like psychologically if you aren't in that kind of like a mindset you know there's obviously it manifests in different ways but that kind of like that you know I'm gonna win this damn jewel kind of mindset and you come up against someone that is like super super confident um it becomes really difficult to win to win those jewels it's a weird little psychological things i don't know if you guys have encountered it but like there'll literally be times where like in my brain i'm like i'm probably not gonna win this jewel and then you lose and you're like ah crazy <laughs> and then you might versus that same that same player in another game and then you know, i don't know you just had a good day and you know you're just like in whatever your zone is and you just like beast mode on them so it's a so there's a recent professional thing. athletes have uh, psychologists mate <laughs> yeah that checks out but um uh, yeah i guess getting a bit of that guru see- factor we want to see them come back to pre Nats one called the Hobart Arch Arch Mongrels, don't we? Arch Mongrels, that's right. Arch Mongrels, <laughs> get a bit Something of mongrel like about them. Get a bit of... <laughs> and then I guess the other bit was um, particularly with their um, their floating being like super quick and on the on the ball with like resetting back into your field pointing states as quick as possible and getting to them and just really, you know pushing the pace i guess um was there anything else we wanted to add about archangels before we move on uh and just again the awareness and practice in those chaotic chaotic end games yeah yeah cool well allow me to do, do, do. fantastic i believe i got that right yeah the last two streams on each of them I've accidentally skipped a team and it's been really awful. So I'm oh, being really? super, I'm like triple checking that I don't do it this time. I really shouldn't have thrown him off, should I? You shouldn't have. Now I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm all over the shot right now. But anyway, congratulations to the Hobart Archangels. Um, really strong, strong tournament. And I, uh, yeah, we, we all really hope to see, see you back in, well, we hope to see all of you back in the same team because I think there's something to be said about having the same team and building as a whole squad year after year after year. But um, at the very least, see all of your friendly faces back at uh 2024 in Albury. moving on to our ninth place team we have the one-up boys uh we have gunner guinea uh yeah or morrow lowlance celery and crouchy boom that was a good one so they were predicted in eighth place finished in ninth place so another team that was down one from their predictions um who is talking about the one-up guys butzer i believe this is you mate I think it is me mate thank you very much um yeah i was uh super impressed with how the one-up guys played um you know look like finished in that sixth spot after round robin that, that i think we were talking about uh how uh round robin to cascade one to two to ascensions results usually go this is a reverse diagram for one up they typically uh in the past have had a bit of a rough start and kind of climbed their way up uh, but the, on this occasion that wasn't the case and there was a, a lot of differences to old one-up teams that um, we saw this year. And I think the uh, addition of uh, two new players um, really helped them. Um, and uh, what I noticed, I think, was a, a big strength of theirs is that they were able to play all different styles of game this year. Like, I had a look, a look back over their results and they had, like, they were winning and losing games playing lockdown games and they were winning and losing games playing blowout games. Like, they were... They were competitive in all the games, regardless of how they flowed. Um, And they were, when the games um, did blow out in the end, they were doing quite well because that was a style that they're typically used to in the past, where the the bit of a more of a chaotic style. So, uh, yeah, it was super impressive by them. Um, I still don't know exactly if it was Gunner or Crouchy running games. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, I couldn't tell who was running them in there, Uh, but they were clearly the two that would go out first. And I think just the addition of Crouchy to that leadership mix, um, I think was a big win for them. I think it uh, it's hard to know exactly how things pan out because you're not there behind closed doors listening to team talks and stuff like that. But it felt like there was a um, just an enhancement of experience and decision-making in there from the team. Um, and they would often, like we played them in a, um, our sec- we were in the second track game, I think, and we'd just lost Dark Passion the game before. And we were like, all right, Let's, buddy, throw everything we've learned up in the air and let's just go for a dump this game. Um, obviously, the wrong decision. Um, so we dumped and went to between red and green and they just just 
absolutely made us pay for it. Um, and they were making all the right calls and doing all the things where you're like, damn it, I would have done that too. Um, and uh, yeah, we absolutely got pummeled by them. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they were they were really good. Um, so yeah, if you guys got anything you want to add in terms of what positive things that you saw from these guys? Lolan said in the chat, he wished he knew who the captain was as well, which is a very typical <laughs> one-off response. Okay, but um, I think on what you were saying, um, of their, them actually being able to play different styles of game this tournament. So uh, going into Cascade 2, I think we'd versed them two or three times and they'd beaten us every single time, <laughs> uh, us being Aftershock. And uh, most of those games ended up being that slower, like more of like what the meta game was, um, which was, yeah, obviously, you know, one up in the past. They've been typically super chaotic, you know, dropping, leaking heaps of bases and kind of struggling in those lockout style games. But um, I mean, yeah, at least they had our number, uh, which was, which was, it was, yeah, there's a point in the tournament where we'd beaten every single team except one up. And they'd beaten us like two or three times, and we were like, "Oh, this is just our this is just our boogeyman team." But we did; we were able to break the curse in Cascade too, which was a big relief. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's really cool that they've been able to, do, you know, even in spite of not being able to play like train very much, if at all. Um, obviously, the Victoria scene still really, really struggling um, to see such a. A different style i guess from them from 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 last year to this year it's um it's cool i don't know how they do it but they that they do um when i was when i was riffing them i can remember like you know how there's like in the top 10 let's say there's or 15 there's like a general met like as there's a general way you play each base like there's subtle differences between teams but yeah most teams up in there kind of figure it out and stuff like that and i can just remember riffing them just go like they just had it like they just had the strat they had the overall setup they knew when to push, when to pull, which players are trying to push from green to blue and how that push works and all that kind of stuff. And I was, it, they just played um, really good um, strategically. That's what I, that's what I saw. And, uh, you know, they got the, where they got to on the ladder was about the cap based upon the fact that they don't get to train much. Um, They're in the pack with the other teams that don't get to train much, like the Cobras, <laughs> which we'll talk about <laughs> soon as well. Um, yeah, but there's a certain level you can kind of get to when you've got your unlimited training, essentially. Um, and it kind of shows when you look at their um, tag ratios. I think Crouchy had a 101. And outside of that, I think everybody, they were still in the 90s, you know, they're still okay, but they'd probably want to add 10% to all their tag ratios. Um, they're just not quite as battle hardened uh, as all the teams that are training every week. Oh, yeah. That's, that's interesting. One of the typically like, a very strong pack on pack brawly win their duels kind of team so i wouldn't be surprised if the age two was rough for them um even though some of these players have like touched the system before it, it's more so i don't i think their play style has to be more dynamic which is what we saw from the team they were definitely more more of a dynamic team they moved around a lot more um but end of the day it's still going to be harsher on this team than like an like a quick adelaide team um but yeah, um, these guys. Well, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, run. No, you go. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I lost my train of thought. You go. <laughs> I, was, I, had I, was gonna, I was just going to say as well, with the tag ratio thing, like it's, um, yep, it's definitely about how good you are on the packs, but when you're like ten, 5 or 10% off just in general general battle hardness of mm. playing high-level games, you just, it, you just cough up tag ratio to dumb things. Like... Um, you know, you don't quite crack the last line out and you have to set up again and that costs you another couple of tags and like all the little things that you're not, not quite as good at, um, it comes to, it, like it hurts you on your base average and it hurts you on your tag ratio. Um, so yeah, that's possibly another a reason for it as well. Slightly less less inefficient, less efficient in certain things like, um, you know, cracking bases and, and things like that. Yeah. Something I would say is quite impressive is the fact that these guys didn't like perform about where they did last year in their home site so like i think the new pickups are very good for this team i think celery and crouchy yeah add those extra dimensions like crouchy adds so much attacking force and celery did he get denials this cup not as many as the last comp yeah he's a not as many as gunner wanna, yeah <laughs> uh no, they, they 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 complete the team nicely i still don't know who anchored for this team though 
I think it was a lens? combination of Guinea or Moro kind of jumping in. So I remember so pretty much every time Weavers won up, they were green. And every time I ref them, they happened to be green as well. Um, but I think uh, for the most part, it would be Guinea in the base. Um, actually, when we played green, I don't know what was going on. But I, I remember specifically the start of the game, it was like Guinea in the base and then Gunner on the back door, and then Crouchy in the, the sweep area of green, or like sweep to front. Um, so that's, that's now that I think about that, that's, that's totally like not, like if you were just to think like where the people played, it was whack. But anyway, I think for the most part, Guinea was their, their last line. But actually there was a time we versed them when they were red, and um, we were blue, and we, Sean and I, or Fuggin and I attacked them, and it was just Mora on the back door and Guinea on the front door, and they didn't have anyone in the base, and they were just taking jewels. Um, I don't know if that was like a normal setup for them at red, but that was a, that was a yeah. thing I saw sometimes. <laughs> I think they are known for obviously not putting someone in the base. Um, La Lowlands is saying he was in the base, which does make some sense, but yeah. I, yeah, yeah. This team definitely yeah, needs. Yeah, yeah, this team right. definitely needs that dedicated player that can comfortably anchor at a lot of different bases. I think that's a very glaring weakness for this team, which is also withholding them from reaching any further. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That was the sure. big, biggest uh, thing that stood out to me as well when I had a look at that section, and I was like, oh, it's, I need like a, like every top team has a pretty solid last line. I think it's one of those things um and yeah for one up that's kind of the, the gap for them um find somebody who can anchor and be be like their husky oh, we'd all like a husky wouldn't we <laughs> yeah that'd be nice <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um we'll i guess um on that topic like what are some things that um this team could improve on assuming they have the same roster going into going into next year based on what we saw this year yeah, that's. What I was going to say the, the the last line thing was clearly the the, the biggest one, um, and then the, just practice. I think for them, like, um, you know, they, yeah, it'd be nice. Like they've got, I think they've got the skill on their team to have those players that can get up around the 115, 120 percent tag ratio, um, and get those you know 50 tags a game. They've got those players on their team. They probably just need to train more, um, and obviously that's the challenge with who they've got to train against. Yeah. But, Hopefully, more uh, Aubrey's going to be close for them, um, and also with more, you know, state-based comps happening around the place. Hopefully, Canberra can keep running things. Hopefully, they can get some practice, even if they don't have, you know, people at home directly to train with every week. They can hopefully find enough competition to keep them fresh. Yeah, it'll definitely be good because this is a team that was trying very complex out there strategies and like trying to specifically counter teams, which is something that was very rare in the competition of actually going this is what they these guys do i'm gonna do this to prevent that happening um often though it just wouldn't pan out and i don't know if, i feel like it's more the execution of the strategy than it was the actual strategies themselves sometimes i mean one of them they had a strategy to just sit one person on myself and twinkles and that was hilarious um but, but i don't i don't see that ever actually like being a viable strategy but uh no from the other ones i saw them pulling i think they were, they did have like a good plan a very in-depth plan and then they just not follow it or just like someone would just break down miscommunication something like that so yeah i i think um really sticking with the the plan they set out or being able to all adapt together and all being on the same wavelength is something that would be very important for this team because they are an old team but a very changed dynamic from what's what they once were so they're still figuring that out but um will be very interesting to see once they actually can start to implement these crazy plans yeah yeah i think um just being able to you know i think the, the something that the, the queenslanders do a lot is they do a lot of like the avd drills which i feel like once they get to nationals if you're a, like so adelaide for instance doesn't hasn't in the past done a lot of avd drills we we do way more team games and so something we we noticed this year is like when we got to nationals like when we come up against the queensland teams they just feel that little bit sharper from all the avds they've done and the advantage of doing attack first defense type drills is one you get to work on like all of the fundamental mechanical skills of the game 
and two you don't need 15 people to do it you can do it with you know four or five people do a 2v2 or a 3v2 um and you know i think uh you know if if they if that hole this, this team has isn't like a you know a, a a superstar last line they could you know pick a player or someone that's keen can just focus like make last lining their their project for the next few months and if you know if they ever have the opportunity to train together even if it's only a handful of them you know that player can can take that last line position and get heaps and heaps and heaps of reps in um doing it and i think um that'd go a long way but um we'll move on and i'll get each of you to choose your standout player for the team starting with uh you Butza. oh i was just gonna say crouchy i was gonna steal the obvious one um maybe maybe obvious but uh yeah just because of what i felt it what it appeared like he added to the team from, from an outsider's perspective just that level of strategical um yeah like in-game strategical decision making uh and yeah the team just felt connected coordinated um yeah and i was switched on strategically like they had all they, they were always set up at every base correctly and yeah it uh hats off um i'd probably go gunner i think he fulfilled the role that we often see him playing, but he did it so in a way that was seemingly less chaotic and more controlled than I've ever seen him play before. Um, so he might not have got those insane scores, but he seemed to get them more consistently. Um, with And like still dropped a solid event of Denars, but he made up for it by denying other people. So I, <laughs> and I think that's a big difference from him at Prenas 3. So he, he felt a lot more... Uh, stable at this competition and like the the main force of the team still yeah yeah <clears throat> i think i'll have to go with gunner as well because uh i know four of those denials that he got were on me in <laughs> one game um <laughs> that was painful that was a rough game but um yeah i think like you said just you know definitely fulfilling the role on the team and taking things a little bit more static and slow i guess but i think actually if i was going to give any criticism for gunner specifically and i guess like the one-up attack um is i specifically remember a game we had against um them where we were blue and they had um crutchy and gunner attacked i think it was chuch beefy and i were in defense and um they split doors gunner was on my door crutchy was on chuch's door and they they like didn't really like make plays off of each other there were just like two individuals that were attacking the base at the same time they weren't making plays around each other to to help each other out um and i reckon like if, if i'm remembering correctly in this game i reckon crouchy and gunner spent like three if not four minutes at our base just doing that same thing just taking a duel every eight seconds against us on the doors and blue base was one of those bases where it was like if only one of those people one of the attackers won their duel it made it really easy for the last line to deal with them if they did try to lunge in or at the very least you can just sit there and watch them um the tricky bit of blue was when both of them were up but um yeah that was just something i noticed is obviously the attack was like a little bit more controlled i guess but i think it was it was far too static um maybe too far in the, in the other direction because yeah that that's an example that stood out really big to me it was it was yeah at least th minimum three minutes of crouching gutter just on the doors doing the doing the same thing um but anyway um we'll wrap up the one up guys have you guys got anything else you would like to to add about them no i think we're good um complete days all right well um cool beans congratulations to the to the one up guys um really you know hoping that the victoria scene starts to build up slowly 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 um so you can get some more quality training in but um yeah looking forward to, i think pretty much all or most of these guys are actually going to be playing prenuts one so for those of us going to prenuts one we'll see you then moving on to our next team we have the new zealand cobras so we have Moldy, V Duck, Popeyes, Hatman, Ace, and Arcane making their making their grand return to Zoltak. Boom. Uh, and who's talking about the Cobras? Mr. Butzer is. Take it away. 
Ah, um, yeah, Cobras. So, firstly, I think their predicted um, place was probably unrealistic given how long they'd been out. Um, I actually felt like they played really well, uh, even though, you know, it might look like they played terribly after being predicted fourth and finishing eighth. I actually think the prediction of fourth was probably a little bit uh, of, a, of a stretch. Um, and only only because they've been out for a while. Um, and that was clearly what happened to them. Um, and from talking to them, this is what they kind of shared was that they, they were just rusty. It was just took them a while to kind of find their groove. Um, and they demonstrated through, uh, you know, the way they finished and also their side event results. So they've got, um, you know, a third in uh, doubles and a second in triples. That was Moldy and Ace, Popeye, V-Dark and Arcane got the triples. Moldy and Ace got the doubles. Uh, so, yeah, they were like towards the latter part of the tournament when we started playing those finals. And then, of course, uh, when we came into Ascensions, um, they started to you know blow out the cobwebs and started to find their groove and um just from refing their games as well towards the end you could just see their biggest weapon was their experience uh, they knew exactly what they were doing in there they'll set up correctly um they were uh yeah communicating like really well top level communication um and yeah what probably left them down i would i wasn't uh you know uh, always there to see all their games but uh it was just the uh the I guess when I looked at their tag ratios, again, they probably looked like they were 10% lower across the board than what they would like to be. Um, so Ace and Hatman are pretty good. Uh, and then um, the rest of them were pretty good as well. Like they're pretty good tag ratios up for that level. Uh, but they also spent a bit of time around 11th-ish area. So they probably would have wanted to be a little bit higher than those tag ratios just to touch. And, and the same with the base average. It was okay, but just a touch off where where they would probably expect themselves to be. Um, and that's probably the story of their tournament. They were just a little bit rusty at the start, a little bit like a little bit off. Um, and then they made a good run at the end. They managed to climb into eight, but they had a lot of work to do. It's, it's very hard to climb more than three spots, especially when so many, when games are finishing so close, like it's very easy to almost draw with first place, but get a second and drop down a track. You know, you've got to, you've got to get a lot of luck, luck go your way throughout the, throughout a finals um, series when all the teams are so close on skill level. Uh, so that's essentially probably what happened in finals is I looked at the finals results. They were in all the games they played um, and they probably just, you know, ran out, of, ran out of chances in the end, trying to climb too, having to climb too far from 11th. So uh, yeah, that was kind of, uh, kind of my overall analysis of it. Uh, how did you guys see it? Um... I mean, very similar to one-up, very, very similar team, right? Like, yeah, down to the lack of experience, down to the play styles, down to the lack of that anchor player, which I, it's exact same thing. Um, they say anchor slow you down, but like in a, t in a maze where an anchor player can really carry a game, I think having that player that's really comfortable doing it um, and is actually able to make moves playing that, that role is actually experienced in shifting the game is really important for a maze like Hobart, where the anchors have a lot of control. Um, and it was something we saw with this team there. Uh, it was a bit weaker. Um, I think I think I trained against them on like the unallocated training once, and I saw how they held, and I told George three days later, hey, fire a shot in this direction, and you'll hit their anchor as you run, run this way, because they'll be out of position, and it just works. And it's like... Um, just that sort of thing of just known weaknesses because there's not that player that's like prepared and ready in that in that role um, sunk them a lot of bases and forced them to be overly uh, more aggressive than they they otherwise needed to be if they were dropping less. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that was definitely something I saw a lot. I think we only versed them twice on the run robin, um, but I also happened to just ref a bunch of their games, but they were dropping quite a lot of bases, and I think. Um, in an arena, specifically like this Hobart arena where the meta was a lot more controlly, and you know teams are winning with like four bases and a bunch of field points. If you're the team that's losing a bunch of bases, it kind of it means you need to go aggressive to 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 be able to catch up. And I think yeah, just it forces you to a position where you have to make non optimal decisions, right? But like you just like we need to do something to try and get back into this game, and against you know some of the best teams um 
that's 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 just basically you know if they know if they respond properly it's just going to push their lead even further um but um yeah no and i think something that's really unique about the cobras um team and something maybe that blitzer can talk to more 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 about uh having versed them a lot in like their their prime period i guess like when when blitzer was on the maroons but um they're a very unique team in that um in terms of identifying like this is their in-game leader is like it's very difficult like if you ref one of their games you'll see pretty much everyone will make a decision at some point like a call on the game and the team will like communicate it quickly and like just follow through with it. it's kind of like a the cobra's hive mind so to speak <laughs> um it's a really really unique way of doing it i think it's a style that is only going to work if you're a team that's played together for as many years as the, the cobras have i feel like if you're a, like a first year team and you're trying to replicate that it's um probably not not viable you'd have to sink like a lot of time into it um but yeah but can you just because it is an interesting part about this team can you maybe to enlighten us a little bit more about that and how that looked um you know lends their experience of this tournament through that and then you know you can maybe draw on your experiences from versing them uh, in the past on the maroons yeah i guess uh the big difference um in the past was they were a different makeup so they had margi um and ace and arcane were playing for the silverbacks i think back in the day um so it was a slightly different dynamic so i don't know how the dynamics change i actually don't really know how they make decisions this, I, I was also not sure and i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry to i wasn't sure which who was actually running the games in in with the cobras either inside the arena um what you're what you're sharing with me is that they might not have one specific um, person making calls so i don't actually know i'm so sorry to the to the uh, cobras for not actually knowing that um but yeah the, it's hard to know whether it is a strength or a weakness or not unless you actually play inside of it because um how teams lead themselves like that would style would not have worked for the maroons to have that style of leadership in the game we needed one clear person running the show uh, and we would chip in um if we felt like maybe the game controller was um, missing something we would go and mention it to them but it's still their call <clears throat> kind of thing um so and that worked for us so yeah i'm not going to pass judgment on how other teams play but um for me uh, i always preferred that because it um it, you know what happens if you get to a disagreement in the middle of a game and you've got a democratic process i just think that can time is the biggest killer in that situation indecision is the biggest decision. so at least having a solid leader gives you a clarity of decision each time Vidak so, in the chat said that the opposition runs the game which is an interesting way of like true, thinking about it true. i guess like if you're a reactive yep. team and you're you know you're just doing things based on what the other team's doing um yeah i think that's a that's an interesting way of saying it but then ace uh yeah i assume that's ace unless there's another the ace and Z. that was a silly thing to say. anyway i said that the <laughs> dynamic is, <laughs> the dynamic is still similar but they and they don't play like positions so i guess they kind of just you know when it's time to float they all float out in directions and then when it's time to crunch like they crunch and then they go well no one's in the base i'll jump in the base um, a little bit more um, dynamic, I guess. But um... I guess the, the one thing to add is that, um, yeah, we would basically be in that mode for 98% of the game. Really, I need, to, need somebody to make a solid decision when a big decision has to be made. Like, okay, you know, there might be the, like, timing is the question I put out to them. It's like, yes, you know that a, a scenario is arising where a dump is going to be needed at a certain time. You might be falling behind. Like, having a, a solid uh, decision maker that means that they take responsibility for the timing of that um but you know they might have a, a, a way of doing that uh, like a certain trigger that happens in the game where they know the timing's right to, to pull the pin and go do something at a particular time so yeah and they 100 percent right 100 percent agree with v dark the opposition does run the game because what's happening in the in the arena is uh you know obviously the, you you generally responding to to things that are happening in the game to give yourself the best win percentage right so uh, I totally totally agree with that too yeah 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 well um i guess i mean, we've touched a bit on like um a bit like how to play it and stuff um do any uh, either uh, ooh, uh, <laughs> that a moment. all right i'm back um who is your stand-up player for the for the new zealand cobras both of yours um, I'd probably go Ace. He was the one that I mainly saw in doubles a lot. Um, 
and I would say that he was quite impressive in his movement and his positioning, and he was also very confident on the panels and playing the bases. So he was that main player on the team that I thought felt most comfortable just like taking a base while watching a door, just like those core skills he felt like the most well-rounded at. Um, so I, I'd say he was the most impressive to us. What's up? Yeah, um, I there wasn't a super, super standout standout, um, but I'd have to say Ace from what I saw, just mainly not from playing, just from refing and watching him play. I just thought uh, he's, you know, uh, still got it. Still got yeah. it, old Ace. Yeah, still, still playing like a beast and, you know, gets himself a, a handy doubles trophy to go with it. So, yeah, but all in all, I think they all played pretty well. They all, all, all played mm. good quality laser tag and... And I guess and we should, probably should shout out as well. Did Popeyes didn't play the fi finals, did he? He hurt himself, hurt his toe. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I think chat. it was actually broken, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, somebody trod on it and then he went and kicked it into a wall afterwards or something. So he ended up not playing. So not sure how much that impacted there. Apparently they don't have any spots, so it probably didn't impact at all. But if they had positions, it might have uh, wreaked, wreaked havoc with their setup. So it can do that when you lose a player, can change things a little bit like that. So. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in before we... Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'll also mirror the Ace pick. Um, I'll speak a little bit about why it's maybe hard to pick one for the Cobras, but I think Ace for me on the team has... Um, I like that. I like the, the the energy. I was talking a bit before about like having that bit of like a grrr, you know? And I feel like um, the Cobras are all like... Obviously, they're all super, super good players, but like... Um, their energy in the game can sometimes be almost uh, mute or like neutral, I guess. Um, but Ace is one of the players that can, you know, bring the heat. You know, uh, and it, he's got a bit of that bit of that guru factor, which I think really helps him in, um, you know, coming up, coming up against like a defense that's like super solid. Um, I feel like it's a big part of, like I was saying before, this is the psychology of like helping you win those duels and having that conviction to like, no, I'm to, I'm going to win this duel right here, and then I'm getting that damn base. Um, and I really like that kind of kind of energy. So, but I guess on that point, it's kind of, and I mean, if you look at their stat spread, like their everything is pretty even. Like all of them are around a even like a, a one tag ratio. There's some variance of like point one here and there, right? Yeah. But all their bases, like... all their oh yeah, you go. I was just sad v wasn't that beast. I was expecting him to be. He was so good on Pro in his maze. Like, I know it's a different maze, different system, but yeah, he just a completely different player, unfortunately. Would have liked, yeah, would have been He's in the chat. He could, maybe he could tell us why. Yeah. What happened, v Because I looked he, at that and I was like, oh, I was thinking it was mm, going to be a bit higher yeah. tag ratio. No. He, he was so solid back when we versed him. So, very curious what happened there. But you're and saying? I guess, um, yeah, so part of this team being a, like they don't play positions. <laughs> kind of team and they're all kind of <laughs> making independent decisions and stuff it means they kind of they share around the responsibility of like all these different things i guess that inherently makes it hard to pick a, like a standout player when they're all kind of the cobras um it's just like a, a factor of like you know a, a part of how they play but someone uh someone said something <laughs> ace said he's washed <laughs> beefy said washed <laughs> Helios okay. team, maybe. i'm curious v-duck were you we if you v Duck, were you finding you were uh, just losing more jewels on um and you feel like that's where a lot of your your tag ratio went was like losing jewels or do you reckon it was you know the position you played and not being in field pointing positions because i feel like something interesting about helios 2 is that um uh, uh obviously there's the barrel sensor and you know v Duck has typically been a player that's like very good at dodging um, you know, always, you know, had a really strong showing in lore as well. Um, but I feel like the barrel sensor is an interesting dynamic to add to that because all of a sudden your dodge where you like pull away to show your side, like if you're shooting at them at the same time, your barrel sensor is still exposed. So, um, it's almost adds that next layer of like the, the dodging, whereas like, you're not only like dodging your body, we you have to almost like dodge your phaser at the same time, or like, you know, shoot a little bit later than you normally would stuff like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, but while we wait for a response, um, have we got, um, any last things to say about the New Zealand Cobras before we, before we move on? I don't think so. I'm, very curious to see what they do at Worlds. 
I'm worried for them. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Do you guys reckon they could win a Worlds on their home turf like this? Um, I mean, where where is is Worlds in Silverdale? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Is yeah. on. Is it going to be on H Pro or H Two? Um, H Two. So they'll get to practice it. But yeah. I mean, uh, Worlds in your uh, home arena, like you know, um. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to be training really hard for it. The New Zealand scene has kind of died off a bit because of COVID. Like, New Zealand got pretty met, mucked about with um, COVID laws and stuff. But now they're getting back on their feet. I feel like I feel like they're going to make a... Yeah, they could definitely win a, win a world. For sure. <laughs> yeah, right interesting. We don't know who else is going yet either, so it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a bit of a... Um, V-Ducks invited you to find out, Run. Of course, I, I, I definitely intend to. <laughs> he hasn't responded to our question yet, though, has he? Uh, he has. He said he doesn't think the barrels get hit much at close quarters, kind of countering what I was saying. But he said maybe some tag ratio to paneling and some to dueling. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So well, I felt um... like with them and the one-up guys, it's like they might have coughed up tag ratio, but it, it might have been just across a broad range of things because of yeah. the, the lack of practice and stuff like that. It's not one specific thing, but that's what mm. it kind of felt like. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Well, have we got anything else we'd like to say about the Cobras before we move on? Keep coming back to Nats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything, run? Nah, we do still need these guys. I hope they come back, yeah. They can put some. <laughs> well, um, yeah, congratulations to the Cobras guys. It's really good to see you back. I hope to see you see you back again for 2024 and um yeah we'll move on to our next team in seventh place we had eclipse we had taipan mopar robo butzer dark passion and mr orcas orcarai boom so this team was predicted in fifth place finished seventh so down two from the predictions also if you haven't been paying attention uh the lsa predictions were like the most off they've they've ever been for this <laughs> tournament. It's it was crazy. There was teams that were like seven to six off from their predictions, and most teams are like a minimum like two off of their predictions. Um, so I'm glad. I I if you you might have missed that like for the pre nuts we did all of the um like the prediction game scoring thing. Um, I admittedly uh lost all of the spreadsheet stuff that had like which individuals uh, predicted which for, for who. So can't do the predictions game, but if we did, we would all have been really bad. <laughs> I've got a um, I've got a challenge for you. Can you redo those results, but look at the post Cascade 2 results and not the final results and see if that, see how different it is. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I've, I've got a, my, my, you know, when you've got games that are decided by, 100 points uh playing anything can happen in a single game but i feel like the end of cascade 2 results is a is one indicator of how a team went and then the, obviously the post finals results is another one so i think the predictions you may find they might sharpen up a little bit if they're um compared to the cascade 2 results anyway there's a little thing that we can do in later in a, in another time over to you run <laughs> um interesting it's me is it me talking about this team? I think it is me talking about this team. Okay. I'll take it away. Um, cool. Eclipse. Um, I think we came up against you guys uh, quite a few times. Definitely heaps at the prenuts as well. But um, I think, uh, 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 you know, at least three or four games against you guys, I would say. And I think what was interesting is um, you pretty much played the exact same strategy we did. Um, or at least that's what it looked like from where we were. Uh, obviously, you know, you had like little, little, the little one percent differences here and there, but um, particularly from red, it was like exact same, which I thought was really funny. Where we had like, you know, you when you guys were red, you would be the person like playing like around like the green sweep area, which is exactly what I did, and then you would have Taipan rock up on like the front door and you guys would break through the front door and you might have a third person if you weren't being attacked that would push up and then help you it was like almost exactly what we did with some small differences but um yeah i guess it's it's it was always 
super it felt always felt super um close and tight playing against you guys because you played the same kind of style and it was very um disciplined you know it was really hard to a lot of the aftershock strategy for getting one base was like that's just where the setup was really strong but then to get the other was basically trying to catch them out and there was a few games where you were the base that we you're the base we're trying to catch out right waiting for you to do something and then attack you but every time we did it it was you know it was you guys would be super disciplined on crunching um mopar was doing super super well um particularly under to under red um he was very difficult to to tag out and he actually did it differently to everyone as well where everyone for the right handers on the v they would be like on the low hold watching the that door but he was on the high hold um which i thought was an interesting interesting difference but i mean it was working for him um yeah i think that's just the story from my perspective of the eclipse guys just super disciplined well-oiled machine um making set plays not just like randomly chaotically running around obviously you know the we had a, a few times refing or against you guys where dark passion would do the classic dark passion thing where he finds some sneaky way to get behind everyone shoot everyone in the back and get a base um but for the most part very very disciplined um which i think is really cool to see um i guess looking at your thing me um your maybe you can comment a little bit on it as well but uh, but obviously you know everything outside of the uh, ascensions is looking super super good you know what i mean like seeing that uh incremental improvement from each each stage to the next one i think is a really it's a really important thing to try and strive for um because it just means that you're you're not falling behind the rest of the pack like you're keeping up with everyone and you're making the improvements that you need to and you know making the iterational changes to to keep you know changing those little one percenters to keep getting those you know you know struggle to get the base here change this little thing and that makes it easy to get that base or you know we leaked a base here change that little thing and suddenly we're leaking a lot less bases so but um but so what can you did looking at that ladder is the ladder like how it felt for you guys yeah so um we were a new team so um same thing happened in the round robin that happened at pre-nats three which was we were lacked a bit of consistency we were still working out ironing out some things so we were just in the pack with the rest of that six to twelfth pack um in there somewhere we were eighth and then yeah we got our stuff together we climbed up i think um when i looked at the top 10 i kind of and this is very ge like big generalizations but i hobart vikings were in their own kind of category in my opinion um then you've got catalyst aftershock and spartans were in their own category and then storm was in their own category and then there was the rest i feel like storm were just a little bit better than all the other teams and i'm not sure if we were in the same category as storm or catalyst aftershock spartans because we didn't because what happened is jesse got um injured in the first game of um the finals so we had to play pretty much the whole great um, finals <laughs> without our, one of our best players um we still had five in there of course we had a had a sixth player uh but jesse's a pretty like when you're trying to yeah you know, when you're trying to compete against the best teams um there's a pretty big hole in our roster and of course it shifted all our we do had we did have roles in there um and it shifted everything around so yeah, we um, essentially lost the first game. Um, he got injured about halfway through, like properly injured. Had to swap into last line and just kind of try not to get shot too much. <laughs> um, and then uh, in the second game, we kind of like threw everything out and we're just like, oh, shit, we've lost Jesse. Um, let's just like do something that we haven't done the whole comp and like go and dump and and try to get 10 bases. Anyway, we weren't very good at that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were like third. We, so we, 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 we kind of felt like we started finals in the third track. Uh, we were like, okay, we've got one chance left. And we went back to a normal strategy, which I think we picked red because we, we two of us had had like a, an inkling in the morning, like we had a gut feel about red, and we were, but we went against it in the first game, went green. Um, anyway, we chose red, got a win, um, and then we got knocked out. Um, we probably hit our cap at that point. So definitely, I felt like we were around probably about the fifth best team, um, you know, leading into the finals. I think that was a, a fair assessment for us. We would have maybe been able to climb higher, but I don't, I didn't feel like 
from watching you guys. I don't think we were as organized um, and as good as what you guys were um, after shock. And I think that was probably about our, our cap at, at fifth. Mm. Um, and then of course losing Jesse, it kind of just didn't give us a chance to really test it. Yeah. So we kind of went out, we're probably lucky to hold on to seventh, to be honest. Um, yeah, we were a bit rattled and yeah, we managed to get one win, which kept us in that, uh, that realm and we finished seventh essentially. Yeah. Um, sorry, Beefy's comment earlier was amazing of Blitzer joining (laughs) the team and then calling it a new team, even though they were definitely already team, but, (laughs) um, this team, was, in yeah, this team was really interesting. Um, you guys were the only Queensland team that really maintained that three-man attack, is what I saw. Um, so it felt like pre-match three, Queensland were like, we're bringing this strategy. This is this is going to be the Queensland way at, in Hobart. If three-man attacks, like blitz hits, quick. Uh, three-man attack, two-man attack is prepared. Uh, two-man defense is prepared to be a two-man for a bit. Uh, three man gets a quick base that's closest to him often and then comes back um, and then back to I don't know a 4 one e type thing looking for another opportunity to hit that three man um, you guys were the only ones that actually maintained that I'm curious why the other Queensland teams diverged from that and you guys maintained that strategy is that a fair assessment but do you know what happened there uh, it pro- might have appeared that way uh, but we kind of just had a setup and we had a license to float so we just rocked up with yeah, three okay. players at random times so yep. that's bad. and i was often playing mid so i'm a fairly aggressive mid um so we'll end up with three in attack quite often if i can yeah if yeah so were you guys yep. starting with a three two then like uh two attackers or what were you guys doing uh we had would have one out um you know basically permanently allocated to getting points and trying to just be a nuisance um and then a second attacker kind of the first three minutes would be second attacker floating back um and then yeah we'd start to this the um second attacker would start to be more aggressive around the two or three minute mark once the game started to break open yeah yeah okay yeah interesting um it, it would just give us i think all the teams played it very differently. I don't know, Ryan, in your middle 10 video, you were kind of talking about this defined meta. It was something that I never saw in Hobart was a really clearly defined meta. Every top 10 team seems to do, like pretty much all of them did quite different strategies, like far more different than we've seen in in nationals in the past, I would say. Every team had their way to play it for. Um, And like, we thought we were defining the meta, but nobody really followed us so if we, we would like when your first place team is doing something completely different to everyone else it feels like there's no set meta um so yeah i don't know it was interesting there um but yeah eclipse it felt like they were quite good at trying to punish teams for the way they played they felt like one of the teams that were actually running counter strategy so in a sense i mean it like eclipse gave us some of our hardest games you guys took a few wins off us i think um by it's actually, you went to hospital. Fun. <laughs> Look that you went to hospital. We managed to get the game where Runt had to go to hospital. Yeah, yeah that was us as well. We were in there too. Uh, Woo! Uh, I yeah, thought that right. was another one too. Did you get a second or a third? Uh, Who did? What did Hobart get? Very, I think Hobart got third, the third. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just uh, to show that, that one player can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I, I yeah, I, I was, I was, I, th- I think you guys ran the best strategy of all the Queensland teams, um, from what I saw. Um, Kind of. I, I think, I mean, technically the Spartans had the best with the dumping because that worked out so well for them. But I would say the best general strategy was you guys, which was very similar to the pre-nut strategies you guys were all running, but everyone else diverged from that, whereas you guys kept doing it. So, yeah, that was interesting. Um, anyway, over to you guys. Yeah, well, um, I guess, to be honest, it's, it's, it's kind of hard for me to even... Cause we'll talk about like weaknesses of the team now but it's it's kind of from my perspective it was hard to for us to like identify one because you guys felt like a team from the outside that didn't really like make mistakes like i was saying before a lot of our um <clears throat> aftershocks attacking was a setup towards one base and then the way we got the other base was by catching them out when they go to attack somewhere else and it felt like we could never catch you out um and it felt like we couldn't get you like making mistakes um, I'd be curious to see what, you know, obviously that's not the case. You, you know, every team's making mistakes, um, but that's what it looked like from the outside. Like it looked like a, a tough nut to crack. 
so to speak. But um, Runt, did you did you notice anything against these guys in terms of weaknesses? Oh, look, Beefy kind of beat me to it, but yeah, I was kind of saving this for the weaknesses section. I feel like this is a team that counter to what Butzer was saying about the have one clear leader. It felt like there were a few players making calls that would sometimes be contradictory to other players making calls throughout the game. Like, it felt like a team would sometimes be sort of yelling at each other and one of the more disorganized teams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the more disorganized teams in a lot of instances where there would there just seemed to be disagreements on how to play. And it's not surprising with so many different play styles and like so much experience that was all different. But yeah. It definitely definitely looked like some games they'd either do very well and stick to their strategy and stick to one unified goal. And then some games they would just blow up and then Absolutely take it, it felt like one of the more inconsistent teams to me for that reason. Yeah, um, what can I say to that? Um, we definitely, it wasn't all smooth sailing for us, that's for sure. There was definitely uh, plenty of opportunities for us to disagree, but um, generally we felt like we kept it outside of the arena. Like we didn't, in the arena, we just followed through with what was being directed. Um, but yeah, and like in, gen like in general, like we had a lot of experience on the team. So when you were saying, um, homes about it felt like a hard nut to crack i think that was the individuals on the team like walker for example is one of my favorite mids like when i play with him at teams at home he's a he's an excellent mid because he's such a good decision maker and we had myself and also dark passion who play in that role as well as well as taipan so we had like four really good like decision makers that, that were in the field all the time so that's probably why it felt like it was hard to get around us um but just in terms of overall strategy, there was just mistakes made. Like we were figuring out the meta of the arena, what was what was going to work, what was not going to work. We were trying players in different positions as well, which you have to do to try and get some kind of depth in your team to so everybody's played different roles. So along the way, we made mistakes, uh, plenty of them, in fact. So yeah, and that definitely saw a little bit in the foyer occasionally. <laughs> us, discussing those, us discussing those mistakes. That's one word for it. Yeah. One word for it. Um, well, um, Butzer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do this as well, but, uh, let's pick a, uh, standout player for the team. I'll go first and I'm going to mirror that. Um, oh, I'm going to pick two. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to pick two and I'm going to cho choose Orkari and Mopar. Um, so Mopar for me, he had a 1.228% uh, tag ratio and he was, um, the last line for you guys. And um, I feel like it was um, a really, really strong last line year for Mopa. He just, he just found his groove in these bases, um, particularly red base. Like, I actually don't remember shooting Mopa out of red base. Now that I think about it, um, so like from my perspective, that was um, that was really, really cool to see, um, you know. And then Orker, I kind of like you were saying, um, Butza, he was on the topic of, you know, um, Orker I being a really strong mid. Um, you know, I might, when I'm floating to the same side he is, um, he was really, really good at kind of like nullifying anything I was trying to do. Um, you know, trying to like sneak past, trying to punish them for maybe coming too far forwards. It was, nah, it was, it was super, super hard to catch Orkari out. And, um, yeah, just super making, like you said, making good decisions and really disciplined in that position. So I think from my perspective, playing against you guys they were the two players that i was like damn this is annoying <laughs> um i would say yeah i would actually also say mopar he he's one of the more intelligent anchors um he so i think this maze suited him very well because he knows what people are expecting and he knows the shots and he knows if they're expecting this why don't I just stand in the other corner and they run past me and I shoot him in the back? It's that intelligent style of defending. Uh, and he was actually aggressive with it sometimes as well, which is what you really, really like to see from an anchor, is they are willing to expose themselves to offset a door. He was, I would say, the only anchor that I versed where I would be set up on a door waiting to align with Twinkles and he would peek out to kill me to prevent us from setting up that pins from both doors. It's a very key skill, but it's takes a very intelligent player and it's a very important skill to have which Mopar showed uh he had and I was very 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 impressed by that because he was the only one I saw do it he was genuinely one of the best anchors I saw and yeah, came yeah just to, on the on that topic of like 
the intelligent last line and like how these bases were set up being like it's not like a, a position where you just like hunker in one position and you know if you're good at that position you're good at that no it was like moving around was very beneficial and i think i'll give a a quick shout out to spack spack attack from apex mm. as well he actually had a super strong tournament and he was apex's main last line and he plays last line very similarly to mopar so it's an interesting yeah. now that you say that in like in that way i was like man like spack was having a really good tournament and that's the position yeah. he was playing and it was like for the same for the same reason so yeah yeah cool um <sighs> I'm so What's sad that? I don't get to talk about Apex. They were great. They were absolutely yeah, amazing. But... They were. I know. That were excellent. Um, yeah, so just quickly on the Apex thing, when I looked at the teams, that team from 6 to 10 that were all kind of around the same, I extend that to Rampage and Apex as well. They were in that group. They could have finished as high as, you know, 6th, really. They were like in that group that could have finished that high, but there was just six teams battling for those spots, essentially, in the top in the top 10. Um but yeah, hats off to Apex. But yeah, I'm so glad we got to see Mopar last line because I've been banging on about it for years about how good he is inside <laughs> a base. Um, and rarely you see it because I'm Blue Steel who'd captain or run the attack um, and he hasn't really played that role before. So um, I'm so glad we got to see it in action um, and he got to practice it and get really good at it because that's his number one weapon inside a base is he um, how he thinks about defending, which is being where the attackers don't think you are or... <laughs> Um, at least requiring the attackers every time you enter a base that Mopar's in, you have to like slow down and have a quick look or um, or be in constant communication with your other attacker because um, he could have moved. So it just makes it much harder just to get a roll on essentially as an attacker. So yeah, glad he got to. But you guys have already shouted out shouted him out. So I'm going to shout out um, Jesse Dark Passion. Um, yeah, his stats were okay. Like he got a 106 tag ratio, which is um, you know okay. But I just felt the way he was playing. Um, yeah, he, he he felt like he was like yeah, his decision making was excellent. Um, he's just such a handy unit to have. Like you can throw him anywhere. Like um, he was more um, of a utility than I was in that arena. Like if once I got bases, if I went back to defend, there were certain spots that I wasn't very good at, particularly in last line. But Jesse could literally take any spot. Like it didn't matter who he swapped out with. Um, so yeah, just big shout out to him. I thought he played awesome, and I was just really sad he didn't get to close out the tournament, unfortunately. Yeah, that's uh, that's some rotten luck right there. Well, um, gentlemen, have we got any uh, closing thoughts, closing things to say about Eclipse before we move on to our uh, sixth place team? I would just ask where you guys played Robo. Uh, it varied. Um, I can't even remember where we played him in the finals. Oh, we had we mixed we had to end up mixing our whole combination mm. out because we had a we had a certain base we we're playing Robo from. Um, I can't recall, recall the details, no, but, but yeah, it uh, it changed essentially. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, yeah, mm. it it was it kind of a factor of H two not suiting his gameplay because it, it it does look like a bit of a weak point of the team when the rest of the team was very very strong pack and pack by the looks. Um, but yeah, one player kind of just taking that shit spot or something or what was going on there um maybe i think also the arena is a very fast and mm. dynamic arena um and robo's a very good player very disciplined like if you put him on a door he like at least doubles nearly all the time comms are on point um, but when it comes to like movement around the arena and stuff like that um, especially when you need your players on doors to be floating out and stuff like that he just didn't quite have the same speed and getting between bases he just didn't have the same speed as the other players on the team essentially yeah that's valid anything else we'd like to add for uh, clips before we move on yeah man. you just guys expected are... expect a different lineup next year <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so good on the pack it, it like the tag ratios are all incredibly high i'm surprised you guys when did you guys pick up was it fifth yeah, we fi finished in fifth. Yeah, and fourth finals, like, yeah. yeah, and you're right. That it does hit a bit of a wall at that point, doesn't it? With the sort of very, very strong teams at that point. Like, yeah. Yeah, and we don't just don't know if we were there or not. We, I think I think you guys were easily there based on versing you guys. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I would not say like a big distinction between you guys and like Swans and those sort of teams. And aftershock played very similar teams as Ryan was saying. Yeah yeah well um congratulations to eclipse sorry dark passion about your your bloody your injury that's so that's such a big feels bad for your team but um 
you know, Woods was kind of alluding that we might be a different roster next year, but hopefully we get to see um, all all of you guys back in in, in some fashion. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time, teams will also use an injury as a crutch. Like, no, nah, we just did back because of this. But this seems like a very genuine example of, yeah, if a key player like Jesse gets injured, that's really going to do well the whole team. So I, I think this is a very key case of, yeah, that's a very justified excuse. Like, that that makes a lot of sense why your team drops. Like, yeah. Yeah, we'll, gi we'll give you that one. We'll give you that one. <laughs> the teams are too good. In that top 10, the teams are too good. Like, yeah, we were about as good as those up. Yeah, without Jesse, it was, yeah, we were as, only in that 10th position ish, probably. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, moving on to our sixth place team, we have the Dragons. We had Shifter, Gustus, Dragon, Garn, VG Master, and Finn. Boom. Um, I believe, Budsa, you're going to talk to us about the Dragons. Take it away, mate. Yeah, well, um, first, I just want to say how thoroughly impressed I was with this team, um, where they finished. I definitely feel like they like really maximised what they had. Um, they uh, So they didn't have a super strong defence. Um, often a lot of games I would watch the first few minutes uh, they wouldn't in that like lockdown part of the game where it's just um, you know people pack pointing they would often be uh, like not winning in that part of the game but their second half game was on like they if you actually if we go back to that original graphic that you had you can actually see it in there in that chart that um, uh, yeah, I'll... that runt had let me scroll back Boom. On here. So let's have a look here. So what, what, the color, the... what color are they? Red. Yeah, so you can see they were like, yeah, that first minute they were a little bit low and then they kind of just steady. And then the second half game is like, like after the six minute mark, they kind of, they're right up there. Um, and yeah, what, what I can, you know, all I can gather is that they were, they were very good at playing in the chaotic game. Um, they, they were o totally okay for it to kind of blow out and they were able to play that game really well. Like, amazingly like it, they were able to get bases when things were like completely chaotic and yes their denial rates were slightly higher but not that high that much higher like they were still pretty good considering when you're playing a, like a style of game where you're gonna end up in a shit fight for big portions of the game um yeah so yeah i mean they had gun probably got denied a bit um gustus a little bit um but the other guys like VG Master 0.45, you know, Finn 0.93, a little higher, and then a 0.56 and a 0.56. Like, that's pretty good considering that they're often uh, playing in games that are, are going out to higher higher number of bases. So, yeah, I felt like um, they did really well given that they're, um, you know, on the packs, they weren't uh, like they weren't up there in the top group. They didn't have the strongest defense, but they're decision making in the second half of the game was really strong and they you know copped a lot of um comments about how they they dump all the time and all this kind of stuff and did we see dumps from them yes um but it wasn't their only like thing that they could do and they weren't doing like just the you know the garden salad variety of dump they weren't doing like the same one every time they were mixing it up like they would dump and then the players would come back i couldn't actually predict what they were doing because i think they were shift changing it up and being fairly unpredictable with it that's well i could i didn't pick what it, what they were doing it seemed to be different each time so uh yeah well certainly a game that they the first game that they beat us they dumped and then went back home um which you know if you do it well and at the right time of the game is actually a really smart strategy it puts an up puts yep. one team under a lot of pressure they have to make a decision and then that can open up their base so uh yeah i just uh was i was like they're just they just play the game in the right spirit. Um, they're good characters. Everyone loves having them around. Like you know, I, I don't know how many volunteer hours Shifter did, but like it was huge. So it was just good, to, just to see uh, you know great great humans um, get a good result. And uh, yeah, well done to them. I think um, yeah they should be really proud of their proud of their efforts. And you guys have anything that you guys specifically saw? Yeah, I mean it. Once again, you look at um, a team that has poor. Uh, relatively poor like stats like players low tag ratios low scores all, all that stuff and you go how'd they win <laughs> they must have won with strategy like props to them um granted hell of a lot of dumps but if like it's 
it's amazing whether it works. It, it, it genuinely is. And we always knew that dumping would work. Um, like we always knew it was a viable strategy. It's just, it's not our strategy. It doesn't work for our team, but when you get a team that can fully capitalize on it, yeah, it's going to work if you do it right. Um, I think early in the competition, they did a lot of dumps off the bat and throughout the competition, they sort of um, slowed it down, played played those more mid games. Um, there's more like pack point here and then dump here and then target them when they're weak. That style of dumps, which is going to play very well into a maze where it's all about control. If you can get into a base and control it when they're weak, you're going to be able to actually kick them out. So... Um, I was bloody shocked to see them in 6th when I rocked up on site, uh, that was sick, but yeah, no, um, I think they played it very intelligently by the looks, and exploited a strategy which other, yeah, other teams for the most part thought would be trash, um, so props to them. <clears throat> yeah, hey, I'll gonna... look at this one. So, they played one, two, yeah, they played five games on the last day. Which is a lot of games. My goodness. Um, I think something there's something to be said about when dumps happen on, like, you know, Cascade 1, Cascade 2 versus when dumps happen in finals. Because um, obviously the dump is a, it's an inherently chaotic strategy, right? But when you add, like the this is now finals day potentially elimination games and stuff um the extreme pressure of that on one hand and then the chaotic nature of dumping on the other hand is uh it's a potent it's a pretty damn potent combo um so obviously you know we say dump as butz said it wasn't your you know your, your garden salad dump they were there was actually quite a bit of or at least from the outside it looked like there was a, a bit of thought process in why they were dumping and what like why they were dumping where they did when they did all of that kind of stuff but um it's a super super stressful thing to come up against when you're on that last day and you've got the pressure of like this is the last day these are the only results that matter and they've done oh my god this is crazy um so it's um yeah i i i'm on on one hand i'm not like surprised that they were able to like wins as many games as they did on that last day and make that that you know the climb that they did um uh i actually i think i only burst them like once myself so i don't have much else to add on like how how they played um but did you have something to say yeah i was just gonna say um i really can't wait to get down and play canberra's arena now because so, like we well, say to brendan um on chat a while ago about how we we like we like we saw the Taz Tassie Arena, the Hobart Arena, and we're like, oh my God, this is why Hobart play the way they played that particular arena this way. And they played this particular this way because we don't realize, but um, how much of our home, how home arena influences our strengths and stuff. Um, and I really want to see the Canberra, I want to play the Canberra Arena again now, because clearly they have a an ability to um, get bases in chaotic situations. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a feature of the, the Canberra Arena or not, um, but yeah, I I need to know why they have this ability. But they did it, and they did it con like quite consistently. Like they didn't execute every time. Like there was a lot of games where they've dumped and they've been held out and, and they've lost. But they were they were winning more than enough of their fair share of games um, playing that way. And I thought it was really smart because playing out the like a low base game, like a, a standard low base game, wasn't going to work for them. They knew that um and they would and the and the defense was a bit leaky so they needed to they needed to um have that up their sleeve to climb and that was like their one wood that just got completely maximized on the day on the finals day i think i just want to highlight so shifter was talking in the chat about the um they did uh like quick hits when their when their base went down and that's something that um i think we're starting to see a little bit more of every single every every year um i know it's it's something that's only really viable in a in a smaller arena but the idea is that you know your base goes down sure you lost a base that sucks but you know you can kind of mitigate how much it sucks by getting a base like in return right off the rip and you know the advantage of someone taking your base is that well, no one can take your base for the next 30 seconds. And so rather than standing around, you know, maybe film pointing a little bit, 
or feeling sorry for yourself, you've got, you know, if you account for like the time to get back and stuff, you've got like 20 seconds free where you could just attack a, a base with like your entire team and just try and like equalize the base that they got on you. Um, and that was definitely something that I remember seeing um, refing them. And I think from the game that we played them as well. Um, and something that I think will potentially see more teams adopting in the future uh particularly if it if it is a smaller arena it's not really viable than a big arena because by the time you get there you know mm. even if you do get your base your bases come up at home and you're like well we'll let's do it again um but yeah it's something that i don't see a lot of teams doing but um i know we do it at least aftershock does it quite a bit um we call yeah. it rage monkey rage monkey <laughs> I would yeah, say, I, I think we saw it a lot less at Nationals than we did in Pre-Nuts. Pre-Nuts, I felt yeah. like every team was like, this is the way to do it. And then at Nuts, everyone was like, oh, wait, they're going to be prepared for it and slap us down if we do that. So we definitely saw it less. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure to, to what viability it extended. Um, <laughs> what do you guys reckon? Did you guys say it actually worked much at Nuts? Uh, I... I... I'm not. Uh, I, I'm okay with it to a degree. I don't like every player leaving the base. Um, yeah. I'm not a big fan of that because, yeah, you, you you're at, you're out of position when you fall back on your base if you do that, and nobody knows where any any of the opponents <laughs> are or anything like that. So yeah, I agree with it doing it, but I kind of maybe a bit more strategical in which players get used yeah. and how many get used. Yeah. So I think for. For at least from the aftershock perspective, we didn't do it every single time our base went down, but like particularly in like if we were winning and we were up on bases and we lost a base, it's like well, there's not you don't really need to equalize that. You're still fine. You still got your lead. It'd be in a case where like we're down, or if they have like equalized on bases with us and we were to get back to being ahead of them, um, and I guess um, it was like. At least for how we did it, I don't, I can't, I mean, Shift is in the chat, she can maybe enlighten us on how the Dragons did it. But um, what we did is we had, um, let's say it was myself, Mikey, and Beefy um, in defense, and our base went down. I would always be the player that, like, as soon as the base goes down, I'm like, I'm just sprinting at the closest base, and I'm like, oh, you got my base? I'm going to get that base back. And we called it Rage Monkey specifically because I embodied the Rage Monkey <laughs> mindset when my base went down. And I was like, I'm going to get this bloody base back. You're going to, you're not getting anything for that. And then Mikey would be go to do it because he's quite quick as well. And he'd be like, oh, Ryan's gone super deep. Okay, I'll just like support him here. And then Beefy would like come out the base and go like, oh, the boys are gone that way. All right, I'll like hang back a little bit. Um, so that was like a way of us, like you were saying, um, Butzer, is the disadvantage of that is if teams catch on, then they know when your base goes down, they can maybe like pretend to leave and then come back. Back and if it's a base, you can like lock out with two people. Um, you know, you're gonna spend a couple of lives trying to get back in. But um, yeah, there's you know, it's like a, a relatively new thing, so obviously it's gonna manifest in heaps of different ways. But um, that's just like one way that we we did it to try to mitigate stuff like that. Because I mean, we've definitely been punished by it before. Like we did it a lot at home where we do it, team locks us out of the base, we get back. And we get back in time, but we spend like one or two lives trying to get in and they get another base. And I was like, damn, that's that's annoying. Um, but yeah, definitely a thing. I mean, if you're already losing and you need to catch up, I think it's, uh, if you can do it well, it's a good way to try and get back into the game. But um, if you're already winning, then I think it's like, there's not really much point in, in doing it. You're just gonna risk getting that team even closer to you than they were before. Um, yeah. Anyway, a bit of a bit of a bit of a tangent, but um, let's go to this screen. I know someone has. Do you, do you have something to say, Butzer? Did I hear? Oh. Uh, no, it was just more of a. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I heard him. Okay. Um, gentlemen, I'll get you to pick your standout player for the Canberra Dragons. Uh, you can start us off, Butzer. Uh, well, I've got two. Uh, but I'll. I'll, I'll just mention... I'll mention both. Okay, I'll mention both. Um, first one was Shifter. I just thought um, like a 101 tag ratio from... Like Shifter, how many years has she been playing Nats now for? Uh, not only if, like since Darwin. Was Darwin her first year? So it's only been uh, a few... You think so? Three. Yeah. So she's, she's in the chat. Real, she, hey, Shifter, how long have you been playing for? Since Darwin? I think it is. But to, to, to get a 101 tag ratio um, is really hard at that level of the... Of the, where they're playing around that tenth position, um, well for mo for most of the tournament they're around that. So, 
Uh, that's that was really impressive. Uh, and just coming up against Finn in the arena, felt like he's just a, a good, a really solid young player. And um, yeah, just uh, he's he's so far from his skill cap and already really good. Like he's really good on the packs um, and um, positioning was pretty good. Like really, really pretty good for a, a pretty inexperienced player. So uh, yeah, just thought they. They've got the core of a of, of another resurgent Canberra team there um, to, to come climbing up the ladder again. Mm -hmm. Run? Um, I think I'll just go with VG. He just seemed to pick up the packs, the best of the team. It felt like the rest of the team would kind of pick their phases a lot and just like those really like sort of exposed barrels, which VG didn't. It was more of like a peak shooting. Picked it up well. Um, didn't give you much to go on. So uh, I'd say VG just had the pack skill that separated him from the rest. Yeah, and I think um, uh, it's hard for me to pick. If I had to pick someone, I'd probably choose VG Master as well. Just, um, you know, I think Preanet 3, I believe he had a pretty rough tournament stats wise. Um, and it was kind of a bit of a question like, was vg master like gonna really struggle on helios 2 in the hobart arena and then he comes back to nats and he's like nah i'm just kidding guys and then he just goes to go <laughs> so it was good to see him uh pull in the kind of kind of kind of numbers that we would expect out of a player like vg master um also i guess a quick shout out to to gus with a 1.67 base average um that's really high that's a monstrous monstrous base average <laughs> um so kudos to him for that one um yeah, I don't know. Have you guys got anything else you'd like to say about the Canberra Dragons before we move on? Um, I guess just uh, we didn't talk that much about possible improvements, but I, f I felt oh, yeah. these guys were in the same category in terms of really needing a last line. Um, yeah, that was a gap there. And uh, I think for them, they're rebuilding their scene, right? So I think yeah. they just got to keep working at it, keep training uh, and keep uh you know it, for them it's just uh i'm not sure if they've got h2 coming soon but uh yeah just keep working on the packs and getting a, a little bit um, more even tag ratio across the park on there they had a couple of good ones but they had a couple of low ones below 90 percent. so yeah they're just more training and uh more young talent coming through and they'll be um able to I think diversify their strategy a bit more. I think they were kind of um, limited by the kind of strategies that they could play based upon their list. Um, and they completely maximized what they had um, and they played really well. Um, and now it's time to go get 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 in the arena and train hard and um, see if they can win some other ways. Thank you, Bootsa. Runt, you get anything else you'd like to add before we move on? Uh, yeah, I'll probably echo that. And uh, what I've probably been saying all year is just, more dynamic movement, more sort of um, standing in the open a bit less. Uh, just it punishes this team every time, and it still wasn't nationals, I think. Um, so just yeah, always behind those panels, always always moving around and being aware of where the threats are coming from. I would say. No worries. Well, huge congrats to Canberra Dragons. Predicted twelve, finished six. So they were they were one of the teams that was up six from prediction. So. <laughs> uh monumental effort from the from the dragons dragons team very much looking forward to as puts said it's looking like the camera scene starting to build back up looking forward to seeing uh what that entails for 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 camera going into the future moving on to our fifth place team we're in the top five now baby we have storm cyrex moss big red shock firebird and bones bomb that's a that's a good looking that's a good looking, uh, you know, some good looking movement there. Um, it was interesting that I think uh, Bendigo Nationals was obviously their first year. I mean, I guess they had, they played the Rumble as well in some fashion. I can't remember how similar the uh, Rumble team was to Bendigo team. But what was interesting looking at their thing from uh, Nats is I'm pretty, I, I feel like I remember their placement on the ladder didn't really move much maybe i'm thinking prenuts i think i'm thinking one of the hobart prenuts but they pretty much stayed like exactly where they were on the ladder the whole tournament um but i'm really glad to see they were able to break the mold in that respect and be able to like obviously like round rubber cascade one there wasn't a big jump but 
being able to climb those positions, Cascade Two and Ascensions just shows like they're like they're like I was saying before, they're making those improvements after each and every game, and that's like netting them netting them more wins as they're going right. Um, and I think that's that's what Zoltac is about, right? Is it's it's a it's a marathon, and it's about who, what team is going to learn the most in the arena by the time we get to the last day. Um, and I think that's that's a lot of what the the game is, especially at the pointy end of the tournament. And um, you know they they came real close. I think they were in they were in one golden game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there was I think it was one. Um, yeah. So you know they've they've scraped those golden games. Um, they keep the same roster or, or pretty similar. I wouldn't be surprised to see them definitely like making a strong showing in uh, more than one golden game uh, going into Albury Nuts, but. Alas, this is my team to talk about. Um, yeah, we versed them quite a bit from memory. Um, basic rundown is, you know, they had uh, Firebird and um, Shock. I think it was Shock. Yeah, Firebird and Shock were the ones like going out first. Firebird was their in-game leader, lead attacker. Shock was kind of their opening batsman with a whopping 1.71 uh, base average, which was ridiculous, I believe. I go to over here. Yeah, Shock had the fourth highest base average behind Tiger, Twinkles, and Run. So the the three home to home home team boys. So massive kudos to, to Shock. He was getting them bases and he was shooting them bases, and he wasn't even getting denied like that much. Like usually when with the players we see with a base average that high, like their denial average on them will be you know at least one, maybe a bit more. Right, miss every shot you don't take, as I as I keep saying. But um, you know, relatively cleanly. And then yeah, just another very disciplined team that can be it can be difficult to to catch them out, I guess. Um, you know, they're obviously Cyrex is known as one of the players, like one of the most well studied players we have in in the scene at the moment, like watches so much VOD VOD footage and stuff and thinks about the game and so deeply. You know, I'm sure her and like I've heard her and Madcans will have like mind melding sessions for hours about talking about laser tag and they just cook up the most, you know, crazy stuff, the most um awesome stuff. But um yeah, just kinda kinda like Eclipse in, in the sense that they felt really hard to um punish and catch out. Um and they just had a super, super strong opening attack in uh, Firebird and Shock, which did them dividends. Um and then another shout out, Moss was their main last line um, with a tag ratio of 1.3. Um, very, very respectable uh, tag ratio for a last line, especially at this end of the tournament. Um, he's obviously done an amazing job. And I think it's one of those teams when you look at it and you've they've, they've got all of the positions filled very nicely, I think. Um, and... You know they've obviously got their players that are like much better in certain positions like moss in the last line shock in the attack and stuff but um i feel like they were all able to you know they've all outside of cyrex they all have a base average above one you know their denials against are all like like especially for for for, for, for moss and uh, bones are like pretty good just well-rounded you know everyone's able to do other positions and stuff and um yeah i don't know do you guys have anything you'd like to add about um you know thing how storm played and what they did well i probably have quite a bit because um i think i've probably misspoke earlier when i said eclipse had the best strategy of any queensland team yeah. i do kind of think it was this team i i forgot about yeah. storm as part of it um because i think what we we're expecting to happen was every free nuts we would show the other teams the meta of the maze, which is what normally happens with home side teams. They show every other team the meta of the maze and how, how we play it is probably a quite an effective way to play it. Uh, that didn't happen in Hobart. And I would say the only other team that actually played our strategy similarly would be these guys. Um, so while Firebird and Shock were the first ones out, they played a very similar role to Twinkles and myself. Um, the meta, I would say for Hobart, isn't quite what everyone else was saying it was. To me, the meta was always maze control. Um, it's a small maze where you can see the majority of it if you play it right. These, This was the only team out of, out of Hobart teams that tried to play that maze control and actually control the majority of the maze. Um, and when you can control the majority of the maze, you can lock down games. 
um, and that's what these guys were able to do. Uh, they weren't really hitting those like two man attacks early or anything. They shock was just like sent to a base alone uh, to slow down the game, get pack points, and grind down the game. Similar to Firebird, but a bit more aggressive on his side, I would say. He probably goes to the closer base. Um, so yeah, these guys played the meta of the maze as we saw it, kind of, uh, which was that maze control. And Shock was very effective, and Firebird were very effective at playing those two leading positions. They got really good pack points, they kept the tag ratio high, and they were able to solo bases. Uh, and I think Moss complimented them very well on the anchor, not dropping those easy bases to make sure that the base, the game, is locked down as they like it. Um, quite interesting that, though, sometimes that wouldn't be enough, and when the game was forced open, often by teams that they forced to break it open, um, they were really good at finishing the game off. Uh, we saw in the graphic earlier, they had the lowest base average, uh, lowest average score all the way up until like the 10 minute mark. But at that 10 minute mark, they're getting those final bases to send them over the line. Once the other teams have just broken up and are trying to catch up in the low in the game where these guys are going to be a head on pack points and a head on bases. Um, or even sometimes not a head on bases, just a head from grinding down the game. Um, and that's why I think they're based Averages are surprisingly high because they're so good at finishing off the game once it breaks out as well. Uh, just really sending those two or three man attacks once their heavy hitters are done just to finish it off. Uh, once the other teams, they've forced to play chaotic and forced to make mistakes and then their uh, weaker attackers are able to hit those when they've been forced into a state of disarray. So yeah. I was very impressed by this team. I think Cyrix does a great job to kind of take the back seat. She sits a lot of games and she really coaches the team. And I think that's an amazing thing to be able to do is just step back and just focus on helping the team reach their potential. And these guys are amazing. I, I They made us sweat probably more than some of the other top teams. Like our games against these guys, can't speak highly of them enough. Um, probably one of the teams I would have very few negative comments to say about, yeah. So, yeah. what do you got to say? Oh, I think um, it's two. Uh, I agree with everything um, you just said, Brennan. And there's two things that happened for me that I think were significant for them too. Um, first one was Firebird played significantly better than he did at Prenats Three, um, and that impacted the result a lot because he's such a main a player on that team. I'm not sure what it was, um, but yeah, his um, tag ratio is much better, um, and he just played better. And Bones, as a brand new player, who was only probably confirmed maybe a few months before we were due to go for them to be able to integrate him in. And he's not like an experienced player at home either. He's like um, only just really coming on board for the, the regionals over the last, I can't remember how long he's been playing regionals for, but he hasn't been playing regionals for a huge amount of time either. Um, to get a 99% tag ratio out of a player with that level of experience and he's got a base average of over one. So they're not hiding him somewhere in defense and not not playing him properly, they're actually used, utilizing him as a player on the team to do everything that everybody else is doing. Uh, I think that's significant, especially um, when you've got Lauren who's sitting a lot of games and coaching the team. Um, it, it would have provided her with a huge amount of confidence to have Bones performing at that level. Uh, so I think that had a huge impact on their final result as well. Yeah, yeah. kudos. Well, um, Runt, you were kind of saying you struggled to have anything negative to say about this team. Butcher, have you you got any any oh, potential weaknesses for this team? No, okay, yeah, yeah, take it away. Take it away. Um, oh yeah, I think I think they kind of didn't didn't reach their potential on the last day. I think these guys put it could have pushed further. I think their strategy was perfectly aligned to punish those other teams in the high in the late stage games where um, where those lockdown games are happening more frequently. Uh, it's, I think, a big reason why we saw Hobart teams do quite well on Ascension this day when typically we suck is because we were kind of practicing that lockdown uh, style from the beginning and it was very effective at the end. Uh, but these guys kind of switched to dumping, which I was a bit sad to see. I think if they played their lockdown game, they were actually better at it than all the teams around them. Uh, even if they may have been the weakest team on paper, I would have loved to just see them play their strategy out right through to the end. And I think they could have, yeah, taken taken a higher placing if they did. Did, did they switch to dumping? Apparently, yeah. I heard that. Well, <laughs> I did see them dump in a game, but it was not mm. at the start. I think what they would—they'd fallen behind in a game. Mm. Um, this is probably the 
uh, one of the last games before um, before the grand final. Yeah, they were falling behind and they kind of mm. made a call to dump, I think is potentially what happened. Yeah, that's um, valid. Yeah, and they uh, were unable to pull it off, unfortunately. Yeah, interesting. I think there was two two dumps and both of them were in games after Shock was win. Mm. Um, one of them was, uh, it was a Dragons game and the Dragons actually dumped first. Um... And I can't remember the exact situation of the game, but basically Aftershock had gotten into a strong lead. Um, Dragons had dumped. And then just like, so they, they dumped to us and they stayed at us more than they went to the um, to the, to the Storm base. Um, but we'd also gotten bases on Storm and Storm hadn't gotten any bases on us. Yeah, and it was basically a forced situation where it was like, well, you know, the Dragons weren't getting through our base. We were holding them up, but they also weren't leaving. So there was no opportunities for them to get our base without also dumping themselves and just like throwing it super into the chaos and just like going for a hail mary. Because so it's the last day is like there's no point like playing. playing yeah, for, yeah. You know, I mean, there's an argument to play for second. You get first color yeah. choice in the next game. Just like, you know, you just want to win that game, and get to those damn golden games, right? Um, I think they they might have. I don't know. If they did pull a second. But anyway, they dumped because basically there was nothing left for them to do to to win that game. Okay, um, interesting. But, um, and just played into the chaos. Funnily enough, that yeah. ended up being the game that Aftershock got the, the highest team score of the tournament <laughs> because we had two dumps Jesus. at our base for like the last half of the game. Oh my <laughs> god, that helped. <laughs> oh. Um, but then the second the second one in the last time was in the last golden game against Catalyst, Aftershock, and um, yeah, Storm. And uh, it was a similar, I guess, a similar thing where um. I think Aftershock had gotten a couple bases, Catalyst had gotten two or three bases, and then Storm hadn't been able to get anything. And there was like that was like three or four minutes into the game. And they were like, well, you know, keep up the status quo. We're just gonna keep being where we are. And so they pulled the pin and they ended up pulling a dump themselves. Mm. I think that's I think that speaks to maybe the get the gap between them and the top four teams is that it's just when you get to that top four, you've just got like pretty elite talent across the yeah. like all the way to the fifth and sixth spot on the team um you know and these guys are great and incredible um and they're also bringing a player in who's playing his first nats you know they're, like, they're not quite at that level of experience um and that's potentially like their own for me anyway one of their only like areas of improvement which is uh yeah you know everything else strategically and everything like that they were they were so solid and united too they're just such a good they're all like really united team like you never see them like bickering or disagreeing or anything like that they're just um yeah very coherent very um just aligned with each other so well done to them well um do we uh who who is our standout player for the storm gentlemen uh runt you want to choose one first um i'd say shock he played a very difficult role um <laughs> like it's a fun role but it's a difficult one of just being sent away good luck you are at their base y you need to somehow get points without just being absolutely railed by the defense which is all looking at you and somehow try and solo a base out of that and it's hard to do but he bloody did it so um like a, a one tag ratio is enough when you're in that just constant shit fight because it brings your average score up to 10k and he did that very well so very impressed by him Yep, what's up? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to shout out Bones again, um, just because uh, like that, it, what he what he was able to do with such little experience in his first nats, and he would have been nervous and all those kinds of things. I think is quite incredible. Um, and you know, you got to probably take hat off to Lauren as well because she put him in a position to be, be to have success. Um, and I don't know exactly how they did it, but they had to pre prepare him and get him ready to be able to perform at that level. Um, and that's much higher than you'd expect a player playing in the top 10 to be able to achieve in their first year so well done to bones yes yeah, stellar effort i'm gonna shout out firebird um <clears throat> similar vein as a vg master for like prenet three where it was like you know we were expecting it was how about a fast arena helios two and just like how everything was playing it was like all oh, the fast you know players are gonna have a really good time and firebird is like one of the fastest players in the whole tournament and he's got like the got the reach and the length and everything to go along with it right so but prenet going to print at three everyone's like oh fiber's gonna love this arena and he had a yeah looked like he really struggled that tournament um but it's you know similar to vg master it was really cool and a bit of like like a relief almost to be like oh 
All right, he's back, he's back, he's back. And then, you know, his Firebird's back to back to what we would kind of expect to be seeing out of him. And then, um, you know, in-game leading is a super stressful role, and uh, he in-game led these guys very, very well, clearly. So, um, but yeah, also, yeah, of course, a shout-out to um, Cyrex. I think on a, on a small tangent, I won't linger on it for too long, but I think there's definitely something to be said to having uh, a dedicated, like, coach on your team. Like, if you think of any other sports, like, you know, traditional sports team, they always have a coach, right? There's, and in those, they're not, they're not players as well. They're just there and they're there to coach. Obviously, the difficulty for us is it's all an out-of-pocket expense to get to nationals, right? So being a coach isn't really, you know, the most attractive prospect. Oh, here, come pay thousands of dollars to coach other people and you don't get to play. Cool. <laughs> um, but I think... You know, if we can find a way to, to 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 make that work, I believe having dedicated coaches for the teams would be would be like a like a huge right. It would be we would see a massive leap in the um I believe like specifically the strategy part part of the game for, for all of the teams. Like just having, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, we've got to do some vod reviews. You know, we'll cool, we'll, we'll do some vod reviews, and then you finish your team games, you get home. You know, oh, we're gonna make dinners first, and then we'll do vod reviews. And then you make dinner, and it's like, oh, actually, like everyone's gonna shower. Like we're gonna wait for, we'll wait for everyone to come out. And then it gets to the end of it, and you're like, let's just stop bloody drinking Jack Daniels and Coke and go to bed. How about that? Um, that was our experience. Phoebe, agrees. <laughs> Phoebe does agree. This was the aftershock experience. Um, but uh, yeah, having a dedicated person on your team that's just like watching your games, like with an eagle eye specifically looking for details and stuff and like going through watching the games taking notes and stuff is um yeah it'd be really really cool to see every team having a dedicated coach well, obviously it's, it's it's difficult money wise but um yeah well when when, when the kiwis complete their arena um player tracking um you know technology yeah. all these things are going to be possible remotely as well true very 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 mm -hmm. true um yeah i'm really looking forward to that's supposed to be making a, a Obviously, it's debuted at the New Zealand Invites this year. Was, it, was that this year? I think that was this year. Um, but yeah, it's got, It's looking like they're going to be having an app in action for, for Worlds as well. So that's going to be super cool to see. Um, anyway, any last bits for Storm before we move on? Some some points of improvement for them looking going into the going to their next nationals, maybe. Uh, like I, I try to avoid this one, but like for this team specifically, I would want to see them stay together. I, I think this is a team that has been built up to challenge those top tier teams, and we saw it. They were taking games off Catalysts and Spartans, and yeah, beating Eclipse. Like these guys should stay together and actually follow it through and, and, and prove that they can over overtake these these high tier teams. So, um, yeah, specifically, I'd say maybe maybe jump on the open game a bit sooner potentially because like their average score is very low and sometimes when teams are getting their each other's bases you do need to open up with the game a bit sooner but yeah it's a minor minor thing specific to the hobart arena probably What's up? i think the only thing is um like this the the, the pack on pack of the players it, like in the mid part of their team like you know, like if Bones another year under Bones' belt, if he becomes a weapon, you imagine these guys are easily pushing up into that top group. So that's pretty much it now. They've got everything else. They've got the coordination, the good leadership, excellent strategy. They've got great last line, a good captain. They've got everything. They just need to maybe strengthen, um, you know, you know, all the top teams have like A graders all the way through their list, essentially. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have anything else to add either. But um, yeah. Really hope to see Storm back together in the uh, in the in a the same roster. That'd be really awesome. Uh, being able to build year upon year upon year with the same roster is um yeah super super valuable. There's so many things you build up that you don't realize until maybe you like split up that team and you play on a new team. And there's all these things that you kind of expect to happen. You know all of these baseline things that oh this always happens on, on Storm and then suddenly they're not there and then you have to train those up again. Um, yeah. Definitely, um, if they're able to keep the same roster, train hard, um, you know, make it to a couple pre nuts, um, they will definitely, definitely be convincingly in the top five again, I reckon. Anything else? 
Uh, yeah, just wanted to say, <laughs> I remember shock. He's like, why is everyone surprised we're in the top five? We are in here last year. It's because this year was way hard, way more competitive, I would say. The top five this year compared to the top five last year, I think a big difference there, right? Like, um, just the top ten in general was That's very, very yeah, well, right? v very, very improved from last year. I think we were talking about it before the tournament, but we, we saw it follow through. Very, very, very competitive all the way throughout. So great to see that these guys keep up with that. I haven't seen a hard of, hard of top 10 in 20 years of playing. So Really? No, it was definitely right up there in terms of depth of quality. Yeah, interesting, because we were wondering if it was going to be as competitive as Darwin, so that's good to see that sounds like well, I didn't. I didn't play in the top 10 at Darwin. I was in 25th True. that year, so. <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't know. Can't compare to that. Ryan, do you know if it, if it compared? It was harder, for sure. Oh, interesting. 100%. That's good to know. Yeah, 100% it was harder. Back from um, COVID. Yeah, well, we just need one year to recover, and then we're we're good to go. Anyway, um, big Curtis Storm again, another team whose predictions were wildly off. Predicted eleventh, finished fifth, up six. Huge kudos, and uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Moving on to our fourth place team, we have the boys aftershock. Uh, we have fucking Mikey Holmes. That's me. Chuch and uh, Beefy. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'll go for my spiel. So, um, I think strategy is something I, I keep on touching upon because I think every team does it quite uniquely. Um, you guys were interesting to us in the fact that I would say kept the three-man attacks going. Um, kept... And I've heard your perspective on the game, and it's quite different to mine, and I find that really interesting. Um, I've heard it throughout the streams, is your focus was hit the teams when they sort of push out the other side, which we saw working for you guys. Um, and when we versed you guys, it was very apparent that you guys were dedicating yourselves to one base. Um, very heavy on one side, um, almost completely abandoning the other side. Like, your blue setup was... A nightmare for us because you guys fully pushed towards green and gave us nowhere to stand on the right door uh, uh on the green side door and the le the other side door your anchor just watched that with no issues so i was i was that was a very good approach to a blue base setup for me um in some aspects i think i think you do lose the pack points between red and blue i think a lot of teams i think green was over overly powerful for a lot of teams because they wouldn't play that red to blue stretch which was slightly longer than the green to blue stretch but if you neglect to play it both teams lose out and green ends up winning out so i think in the micro game it's very good for storming green bases and getting a lot of those but in the macro game it can sometimes bite you back in the fact that green benefit if red and blue don't attack each other but yeah still still a good setup that was quite difficult to us to crack um and yeah you guys were very good at shifting your weight entirely to one side and that meant that you could collapse back quite easily because you've got that chain of command running the entire way down the pitch um quite an aggressive team in the fact you guys often started with the two out and went to the three out as well you guys definitely forced that higher base game which was good to see um i think the synergy of attackers is very very important and it was clear that you and Fuggin were a synergized pair. Um, there weren't many pairs of attackers we were seeing around that actually had the synergy to crack bases as a two-man, which is why pre-nats we were seeing so many of these three-mans and these other crazy strategies at nats. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important to just build that synergy together. And that's why you guys had a lot of success in your attack, which was going up against hard defenses through just synergy alone. Um, so yeah quite yeah the, the strategy though when it didn't work it didn't work <laughs> obviously when, when you over commit to, when you commit heavy to something it gets punished hard um the two-man defense was dropping was left alone a bit too long i think as long as long as a two-man defense is alone for long enough people will be instantly able to take it because they know there and there and just simple setup here and here to counter these positions and then you have it every time so when your attack sometimes wouldn't come back it would be a bit too easy to punch through that two men. Um, 
and sometimes if the two man attack just couldn't get ground it couldn't get ground at all and i think we saw that in the graph you guys starts would be sorry was it starts slow i don't know i, I think I, yeah. we, we had like one no. of the best starts the in start the was good yeah yeah no it, it was just a few specific games where your start was just <laughs> i remember i was compiling all the data i'm like oh so this average is really high but some games they just have 700 points at two minutes in What's going on there? Um, and that's kind of what happens when an attack just gets no ground. So yeah, um, a very different approach to other teams in the top 10, I would say. Um, but quite effective for countering those heavy, heavy defenses when they actually try to push out. Because you push heavy, heavier onto them and you're, if your base doesn't go down, it works very well. So yeah. Yeah. What's up? Have you got anything else to say yourself about how we played? Oh, not in that much detail. Um... No, but I guess, um, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was like, I definitely put Catalyst Spartan and Aftershock in a different category um, to a lot of the other teams, especially us. I was comparing you guys to us at the tournament. Um, it just looked, when I was refing you guys, you guys, just to speak to that synergy that Runt was talking about, you guys just looked more connected than, than we were um, and that most of the other teams were. Um, yeah, it was really clear. I saw a game where you guys were red and you're pushing onto blue and you and Fuggin must have gone and came and gone and came like seven, eight times in the space of two minutes. Like you were, you were so willing to work um, to catch the defenders out. You were back, ah, not working, let's pull back. And then 10, 15, 30 seconds later, two of you should rock up again, uh, have a life or two, ah, not working, pull back again. Um, you were just like really hard working and very connected. Uh, which, um, yeah, had you guys get off to a great start, but like with that graph um, that you guys were just referring to, that drop off at the end, it's hard to, like, I can only think of two reasons that might happen to teams. One is that, um, you know, not making the right decisions in the second half of the game uh, and dropping away, or there's a there's a, something happening with the depth of the team. And then when it's time for, um, once the initial players have got through bases, the synergy and attack might have just still good obviously you guys are an amazing team and got a lot of aces won a lot of games but just not quite at the same level as it was when the opening attack goes out um and that's where the other teams were catching you guys that's the only thing i can think of but you would know better than us because you were actually playing on that team so you should share with Sorry. us how much of that makes any sense yeah 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 i'll spill the beans um yeah, yeah cool so as runt kind of pointed out our setup was beefy last line Chuch and Mikey on the doors. Chuch would be on the door position, like not towards the way we were pushing. So she would be like tying up whoever whoever's on like our weak side, I guess. Um, and obviously Chuch is a super dominant player. So, you know, not so weak side when Chuch is on that side. Um, and then Mikey would be on the door uh, on the side that we would be pushing really heavily. So for instance, if we were blue base, beef in last line, Chuch out the front, Mikey out on the side door, and then our <clears throat> our um, default, I guess you would call it, was a three-two. Um, and then Fuggin and I had like kind of set positions that we would be be defaulting to and then working from. Um, for instance, uh, I think one of the most overpowered. Uh, attacking setups in the entire arena so this is why we attacked green all the time from blue was you put for those of us that were there one person in that on that cubby like that panel that was really far away that had vision on the on the last line sean would play that and then all i had to do was win one duel against someone like sweep boy they didn't play anyone sweep i didn't even have to win a duel because basically the the door defender on that side was like a, a free tag pretty much it was really hard for that door defender to stay up and then what that meant is like once I've gotten my one my one duel, I had pretty much a free run into the last line position because if they picked the phaser to shoot me, Fuggin was getting really good at pinging those phaser shots and he would have that angle from the that cubby wall far away. And if they don't pick that shot, then I've lunged in and I've shot them out. And then as soon as I shoot them out, I'm putting shots on the base and then Fuggin's running up to the L wall and he's watching through the base. So I didn't, if you go back and actually watch any of our base takes when we're blue, I pretty much don't actually like watch the other door. I'm just plugging the base and making sure I don't show my phaser. And then Fuggins just sitting on the back door, pinging everyone as they're trying to come through. So that was, we basically had a, that's just one example, but we had a setup from blue to green. We had our setup 
That was our default setup at blue. Our default setup at red was red to green. And then our default green setup was green to blue, but we kind of, we switched that a little bit more. We weren't as heavy on like one side. Um, but why it felt like a three man attack all the time is just Mikey or whoever was on the door on the side that we had our attack when we were in our default state. So in that blue base example, Mikey on the side door. Um, if it was zero, he had the freedom to like run forwards and then like just get a tag or something. So it always felt like we had maybe three there when in reality that third per third attacker was more often than not just the defender like making a mad blitz for pushing up for three seconds get a tag or two you know maybe win the duel that i needed to win to get into the base he wins it for me and i'm like sick now i'm just going to run into the base yeah um the time when we did actually do the three man attack was um when as i was saying we would be postured towards one base and our green light to attack the other base is when they we saw their attackers rock up to that same base. So in that example, if we were blue, we're set up towards green. Our trigger to attack red base was when we saw red attack green. And I was like, well, if they're here, that means there's only X amount at home. And what we did is we, we, we the, the call we made was go long. Um, anyone that ref does probably heard us say it, say it at nauseum. Um, but the comm was go long. And what that meant was rather than bouncing to red through those attackers who would then crunch home on you, and then you would just end up with like a four or five defense, you would go long through the base. We would pick up, in this example, Chuch who was floating towards red, Chuch on the front door, and then our three men, our three, three, three person attack would rock up at your base. And there sh would normally only be two or three defenders there. Um, and so, yeah, talking to what, like speaking to what you were saying, Red, is correct that we were always pushing one base heavy but we had triggers to get hits on the other base and that was that was the the essence of it and yeah. then, um, everyone um had a pretty good understanding of it um i think uh and so what what that meant is that even if i got both of my bases we could swap our positionings and then Mikey would be that person, um, you know, in the default state, he's the one making runs into the base. And when we go along, he goes along. Um, yeah. If everyone knew the strategy very well. So everyone could pretty much play any position. Um, but that was the, that was the essence of it. So, you know, it's a, uh, it was, it's, it's interesting hearing other people's like, you know, what they see from the outside of what was happening. Um, but yeah, that's, that's we, how we played. We, we played, all, pretty much exactly the same mm. as that actually and it's That's interesting what I'm to, <laughs> yeah we played exactly the same as you guys and it's interesting because i think our charts weren't dissimilar either in the fact that ours kind of dipped away a little bit after the halfway point it was yeah slightly different but yeah yeah go. i would say that is that is the strategy we struggled that that felt like yeah a strategy that we, we struggled more with than other strategies so um while i i thought we kind of defined the meta that felt like a viable option to try to counter it which is why i was impressed by both aftershock and eclipse in that sense um is because yeah the, it, it, it's it's another good way to play the maze and it se seems like a more complex version of what rampage set out in early printouts um with that sort of just create a chain down to one base but having the counter counter options is is a very necessary thing to yeah yeah because obviously that, you that... can't you can't only get hits on one base right because if you only get hits on that yeah. one base that base is then that team is then in a position where they can go all right well you've gotten five hits on us we're just gonna dump to the third team that you've gotten no hits on we're gonna hold you out of there get our five hits there you know that team maybe they were out of the game they can catch up there goes your your five base lead that you had now everyone's back on like the even field um, so that was a, a big thing. Like Black like Butzer was saying, um, we would make a lot of calls to go long, which is when you would see Fagan and I run through the base and go to the other one and try and catch the defenders out. Um, yeah, that was our main way of trying to circumvent like that that happening. If we get one or two bases on the on the the one we weren't postured towards, even if the team that we were postured towards dump, we still had some 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 money in the bank, so to speak. Um, and the reason we reset so quickly is because we were cognizant of the fact that like other teams could do that to us as well. And so if we overstay our welcome, when we do the go long strategy, especially if we went with three, 
that's when you know like runt was saying like you can if there's an opening there to get bases on you so that's why we were resetting so often when we did bounce to the other one um yeah but um in terms of weaknesses what did you what did you guys see lay it all out lay it all out don't hold anything back um yeah i think i definitely touched on some of them with that over committing the third player to the base um especially if it didn't result in a base in itself, it left the two-man defense too vulnerable in a lot of instances. Um, and the other one, yeah, is just that if you don't, if you play so heavy towards green, if green is able to lock you out and red's probably doing the same thing on the other side, green's just gonna have all the pack points in the world. So you got, yeah, it's gotta actually break through the green defense to yeah. be a viable strategy, otherwise, you just, give the victory to green, which is why I think so many times we saw green do so well uh, on the base stats. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it was quite viable. Um, th I'm those curious, are good I am curious on, on that point. I'm going to share a different screen now. I have a picture somewhere. I'm curious how many other, maybe people in the chat can tell me as well, how many other teams were doing this, this setup towards green I was talking about. So allow me to... Um, window that one. Oh, I should open it in. I should. I have to open it in Paint. <laughs> of course I do. Paint. Uh, edit. Fantastic. Okay, bear with me, everyone. Boom. There he is. Can everyone see Paint? Yeah. You all can see Paint. Cool. So, the setup we had. Was, yeah, like I was saying before, Fagan would be here. I should pr probably make that a blue dot. Oh no. <laughs> Boom. Fagan will play around here. I would be playing around here. There'd usually be a green defender around here somewhere. This person was like a free tag. They got yep. their last line in here. You know, you sometimes would have someone sweep. Cool, whatever. So. We found that, um, I'm curious if anyone else was using this, but we found that this was like, you are talking about like struggling to get green hits. I feel like we got green hits super, super oh, yeah. easy. Yeah, exactly. This setup. It was, um, it was crazy. But so, did, yeah. you, did you guys use this, this setup yourself? Yeah, same, same setup. Yeah. 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 It was a yeah, very common know, one. Um, yeah. I don't know we would position somebody permanently where Fuggin was, but we would be there a lot. Yeah. Essentially, I wouldn't just sit somebody there, but um, we'd have one there a lot. Mm. So we literally just had fucking sit there because he was, because we also had Mikey would be back here, right? Mikey would be back here. And so it's really, really, really hard to get fucking off of this panel without straight up taking a duel against him. But if you're running, if this person is running up here and taking a duel against him, it's basically just forsaking like the comms and everything on this door, right? So it made it very difficult to deal with that person. So we just literally had him sitting there for all of eternity. And then it would just, yeah, like I said, it's predicated on this person just has to win one duel and then they're in the base. But anyway, just you were yeah. talking about struggling to get green hits. So uh, like, yeah, I believe you. I, I, no, 100%, hits. you guys got him. Um, how often were your fourth and fifth players getting him? Well, normally we didn't end up in a position where our fourth and fifth person even got rotated into that yeah. position. That didn't happen very often because we would, yeah. you know, maybe get the Mikey, Sean and I would get the hits on green and then we would try and emphasize trying to do the go long more often. Mm -hmm. And then when we're at green, less trying to get more green hits, more trying to mitigate bases going down there and really trying to get, get some of those other hits. Um, yeah. Uh, let me go back to my other screen. Mom. All right. But uh, did you have any points for um? Or Brent, did you have anything else in terms of weaknesses? I kind of butted in there. Yeah, yeah. It it's it's definitely viable. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting um, how it plays into can play into green ha green's hand. I think I think is is the overall potential issue with that with that strategy yeah. um but when it works it works bloody well what's up you got anything for for weaknesses for the aftershock group 
boys. Oh, I think for you guys, you're like you're right there, right? You're right on the cusp of like greatness um, in terms of winning trophies and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, probably just, um, I guess, when you get to your stage, it's being have, being able to cycle all five or six of your players into any particular role, essentially, just more filling out the depth. So there's less and less situations that can catch you out, essentially. Um, that's what it's coming down to you guys now is uh, getting getting that level of, you know, where you guys are in that opening stanza, how co- cohesive and organised you are, getting that across all five, essentially. That's probably the biggest thing I can see. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mm. Um, Wax said, Chuch is actually just better. Look at them stats, and he's right about <laughs> that. It's true. Um, hey, we're not at shout-outs yet, come on. We're not on shout outs yet. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about her in, in a sec, I'm sure. But yeah, I guess on that topic, um, can I get your picks for a uh, standout player? And I'll I'll have a pick as well. Um, this one, I'd probably go Fogan. Uh, I, I, I thought his pack unpack was very, very impressive. He, yeah, I've, I've asked him in solos and he, he railed me a lot. Like, um, it, very dominant in his area and could transition that through to attacking play as well so uh, i'd say fucking i i wish charge was able to push out more yeah, I, I think we would have seen more from her if she she were but yeah um yeah my shout out players charge just because getting a 1.23 defending a door is hard yeah. it's really hard there's like <laughs> i think only um wham is up there maybe like as the only other player in the tournament to be able to get a tag ratio up around the 1.2 mark just defending a door like it's just phenomenal so yeah. played out of the skin got fourth in solos like she is an absolute machine um and i just wanted to ask as well so this was fuggins potentially first not first time but he's captaining the team at a at, in those golden games right oh you guys got three golden games last year <laughs> just thought i'd bring that up um just wanted to ask you how how you feel he went under the pressure of those games because i know how well he played all tournament how well did he go in those clutch games <clears throat> yeah i think um so something we actually kind of identified in bendigo was um Fagan is a phenomenal in-game leader and like a probably one of the smartest players i know um uh, but um the way the team was structured in bendigo was a lot of the onus and responsibility in terms of making decisions and stuff was on him. So I feel like he really struggled with that last year. And that was a big part of the, 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 the improvements that we were trying to make going into Hobart Nat was trying to share some of that responsibility he has. So not in terms of like big game making decision, because I'm, I'm with you in that camp, but so that I feel like it should be one person that's like you follow their lead they're responsible for the decisions you don't have any like squabbling or anything obviously like you were saying we'll if we see something that he misses this is this is what we started adding going into hobart and that's is if we saw something that he was missing right like maybe like in that example before like our trigger to go long and attack the other base he might be thinking about other stuff and he just like didn't notice it and it didn't process and i'll go fucking they or i would i wouldn't say fucking i would say sean red's here go long and he'd be like Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I think as a whole, our team was just trying to be a little bit more autonomous and take some of that stress away from him, which I think is part of why he had, um, as you guys were saying, like a really, really dominant performance, like pack on pack, like, you know, in-game leaders, usually they're, you know, their heads elsewhere. So it can be hard for them to have a big impact in those, um, you know, in those pack and pack situations. But, um, yeah, I think a big part of the project was enabling Sean to kind of, you know, give having giving him less to stress about. Um, and then I guess in those last important games, um, you know, I think realistically, maybe he did struggle a little bit with the decision making. But I think also we weren't in very good, like especially like the, the two golden games we had, we weren't in good positions to make good decisions, um, you know. Uh, uh, the first golden game, we was Catalyst and uh, Spartans. We hadn't gotten off to an awesome start and then spartans did their their pain train or bounce stump whatever you want to call it between us and catalyst and the game just kind of like 
fell away from us. Um, I feel like that was less uh, Fagan not making a decision and less and more just like I was saying before, like a dump is an inherently chaotic thing and that chaos becomes even more potent when you're on that last day and the pressure's, the pressure's on. Um, you know, we were in a golden game and it was, it just kind of slipped away. Like stuff like in a bounce up, like you would hear the catalyst base go down and our team would go to like get set up, but like we just didn't get set up quick enough because obviously we were set up to try and field point them in the back, but that we wouldn't get set up quick enough to lock them out of our base. And then they would just blitz through our base. And it was, yeah, it was, it was rough. And then our last game, we had um, Catalyst and Storm. And we'd gotten like two bases, I believe. Um, and then Catalyst had gotten two hits on us. Uh, we had none on them. And they had one on the Storm. And then Storm dumped. And then it was just a, it was a rough situation where because Catalyst had already gotten the, base, the hits on us, it was like we were in a position where it was like, oh, we either need to like hold two bases at once and not let them get anything and try and fill point which is what we ended up trying to do or we need to like try and get hits on them when like you know the, the there was quite a lot of like they crunched their defense and there was quite a lot of storm players in between our base and their base so yeah i think i don't think it was his decision making that failed us um that like that like like that failed on that last day i think it was just some it was some some rough situations and uh, I think ultimately, we definitely, it felt like we lost as a team, not like it was one person's fault, I guess. Um, my pick for standout player is also going to be Fagan. No, he did, um, he did super, super well. Um, just again, I think this is a, a maybe a lesson, a learning lesson for other teams out there who do this setup where like your in-game leader is the... They're the ones making the, the big decisions. Um, try and do your best to take as many of those responsibilities away from them as you can. But like, not, not, not the big ones, obviously, but just little things like, you know, your captain shouldn't have to tell you to like push up when you're a defender or tell you to crunch when like people are coming. It's just like things you should do. If you're a door defender and you're floating and you see your two attackers are just over there at the other base, the captain shouldn't have to come back and like join us for a join us for the attack and then go back to attacking you should just see them and then go oh i've got an opportunity here no one's here i'm going to join the attack for like one life boom, 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 boom. oh we got a base sick and then he shouldn't have to tell you then come home you know what i mean not just taking as as many of those little decisions as you can out of the um captains or the in-game leaders res like responsibility and i think you'll see them one making better decisions in general and two i think it'll uh, improve their um mechanical skills because they've just got less things that they have to stress about right um and then obviously big shout out to chuch um i think she actually struggled a little bit with the the strategy we we're employing um less because of i think she initially like in the first half of the competition wasn't confident she was one of the players that was just really struggling to hit the bases at all um and that definitely affected her quite a bit but then from Cascade 2 onwards, she really just found her groove on those uh, on those doors. And she would just, she would be on the door where like, you know, she's not even meant to get that much pack points. She would come out of the game with like one base and 10k or something and some crazy tag ratio. So um, yeah, big, big kudos to Chuch. She was definitely able to find her groove in those in those last few days. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's all I, all I really have to say. And also quick shout out to Beefy for tearing his calf muscle uh in our uh in our game that we actually got the big score the our third to last game of the comp so the funny thing is you'd think he tore his calf muscle getting like a crazy lunge or something trying to deny someone or trying to get into a base or something what happened was the brief there was late pack starts happening right and what the briefing was that day was if your pack doesn't start specifically if you are blue if you can make it back to the pack room before your pack starts they'll restart the game and so beefy's pack didn't start and so he ran as fast as he could <laughs> from blue base to the pack room he made it in as he activated and he was like restart the game and they were like yeah fair enough and then he was like just he was like i guess had a i think he had a bit of adrenaline going i don't know he's in the chat i don't know if he noticed it in the moment but um afterwards he was after the game he was like yeah my car's pretty sore <laughs> <laughs> and you know the i think I think yeah, the the adrenaline started to wear off. Like if you 
actually i've watched our games back recently and you can see he's not moving around with the same kind of speed and zest he he had been like he was doing really 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 well on the last line position but i think that torn calf definitely he wasn't moving around with the same same speed if you watch look back out particularly our last game um you can see like the the pain starting to starting to settle in but if you said he felt when it happened which is just great i imagine just knowing like oh my calf just tore that's awesome <laughs> anyway i thought that was just a, a funny story um but we've been talking about my team enough um have you guys got any last things you'd like to say about um aftershock before we move on to our finalists no i, I think we would have liked to see you guys in finals i think yeah it would have been a good series to have you guys there seventh eighth or ninth time lucky mate next year <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe fucking was holding you back you guys got this yeah yeah true and that's um yeah maybe it's going to be a different aftershock going into albury um because uh i don't know if this is public or not i'm guessing it is i think he's told enough people he's actually going on an exchange trip to japan during nationals for like six months so we're not going to have fuggin um and then uh you know a couple things up in the air we'll see what uh the aftershock roster looks like going into 2024 but um yeah yeah we've been in i think i've been in six golden games now no one two three yeah i've been in six golden games now always the bridesmaid never the bride is what nickel said uh, when we got eliminated and i think that's uh as much as that stung that's a really good way of putting it um fantastic well well done aftershock was good nats we'll get them next time uh, <laughs> in third place we had the spartans we have Potato, Madcan, Zeropa, Link, The Leg, and Peregrine. Boom. Now that's a good luck, and that's that's the opposite <laughs> of what we had. Is that literally oh, the opposite? Man. Hold up. Hold up. Where they... Okay, they not climbed. quite, but it's, it's pretty yeah. damn close to the opposite. Of Almost the identical, yeah, nice. Um, <laughs> anyway, run. This one's all you, mate. Take it away. Um, Spartans were interesting. I... I think um, they stuck to the strategy they were playing at pre Nats 3, which was that 4-1 style. Um, I'd say the main team to do a 4-1, which was that four defenders, cans, running around, looking for opportunities, getting points, uh, looking for a solo base. Um, they played that. I don't think it was the maze to play that, um, which is why we saw on that those final days. They're like, yeah, this isn't working anymore. Let's just dub, which respect, because it worked out very well for them. Like, you can't knock them for switching to a strategy that worked far better for them. I like great move, great move, guys. Um, and they switched to late game dumps or like half game dumps. Uh, sometimes I think for the most part it was a bounce dump, which is insane that they had that working. But it does kind of make sense. Um, if we go to the stats screen, I'm sure we'll see it. But yep, players all very good pack on pack, very well balanced. That's what you want in a dumping team. A, a team that is all going to be able to get their way into the base. They're all going to win their duels and they're not going to be able to be that weak link that can be targeted. Uh, so like, <laughs> props to them for switching to that dump meta. I think throughout the comp, they were in our eyes kind of struggling quite a bit because they seem to switch up their sort of structure they were still playing the same strategy but switched their structure so like peregrine who'd been prepping to last line praying out one two and three all of a sudden was outside playing a completely different role to the one he drilled so long uh the leg was now anchor and i think he's probably strongest on a door if i had to guess um Zoropa was still on a door um but yeah um potato was a great addition i think he played a lot better at nats than he did at pre and so that was good to see uh, but yeah, I I just felt like the four one strategy was a bit flawed uh, in 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 this maze where you essentially just have that one player just getting a bit railed. Um, like for cans to drop down to a point nine four, that takes a lot of outside intervention. Like he's in a, in a where the, where the strategy works, he would have a lot better 
uh, better stats. I think he's, he's a very, very strong player. So to see him negative, it means he was throwing his head into a bit, bit too hard a wall throughout the game. Um, so yeah, the the dump worked well in the lot in I say lower, but still very high end games. But as soon as it got to finals, when teams were our, our teams were like drilled and ready for it, they just hit a brick wall. Like five, the five players were not getting through either ours or Catalyst defense. So that was their crutch because their opening neutral game was a bit a fair bit weaker than the other two teams in finals. So as soon as they pulled, they had to pull that dump. I mean, they pulled a game one of finals, which you don't really want to have to do because if it goes badly, then you got to pull it all three games, and that's exactly what they did. So it's just like wait for the Spartans dump, and then which team can punish it the hardest. Um, and yeah, yeah that, that that kind of seemed to cap out for them. So it's a bit of an interesting team in the fact they, they just played it differently to everyone else, and I would have been very curious to see what would have happened if they played it the same as the other Queensland teams. It was what I was saying at Preenouts 3, is why are Spartans doing it different? Um, and I think if they did it more similar, the neutral game would have been stronger, but the dump game, <laughs> they were the ones to do it, and they got through to finals by doing it, so prop, props to that specific part for the Golden Games. Mm. <laughs> I think um, to speak on the... Yeah, like we call it pain train in Adelaide, um, but bounce dump, whatever you want to call it. I think to speak to what you were saying before, so Apex is actually a team that used it a lot in Bendigo, um, mm. and they were able to pull back a lot of a lot of games, um, and they do it all the time in training um, at home. And so, um, one of the things when you do that 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 bounce bounce dump is um well for one you actually need to get into the base which obviously that helps but assuming that your team is well rounded enough and you have the aggression and the you know the the conviction to really push through those bases um a big thing is like when you do it and then also what did your field points look like before you did it right so if you see a team that um they're just out of the field points you know they're trying to attack but they're just getting smashed they dropping bases and stuff like they're dropping quite a lot of bases and then they do the the pain train that team's not going to be able to pull back a win right because the you know the other teams have a bunch of their base already so they can kind of take their time to cycle take their turn cycling it and you don't have the field points so even if you did get the bases you're still out in the field points and the other teams are going to get their free bases or whatever right um what makes it really potent is if you a do it in the back third of the game and b if you were able to accrue quite a lot of field points in the interim and what that means is um if you're acquiring heaps of field points and you're kind of especially if you can mitigate how many hits they got on each other as well and you don't drop many bases yourself when you go and do that pain train what that means is hey you're up in the field points so once you get the bases if you get up on bases you're up on pack and field points because when you do the dump you're at least going to be doubling with everyone right and b if it happens in the back third and you haven't dropped many bases it's a very very difficult situation for the two opposing teams because they've only got so much time to try and get all of their hits on this empty base which it, when a team dumps at the start then it's like you both rock up and you go okay we'll let them cycle it first and then we'll cycle it later but if it happens late enough in the game there isn't time for you to to delay you have to get your empties because if you concede the empty and you're like we'll just get our empties later and the other team gets all of theirs by the time it's your turn to get them you barely you don't have enough time to get very many at all yeah and then well, you know, maybe maybe you're able to crush the pain train at your base but they're still going to be able to get the other team's base if they're getting their empties. And then if you decide to go, okay, we're going to fight for this empty base. Sure, you might beat the 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 third team and get your more of the empty base than the other one. But the pain train's going to have less resistance and they're just going to like smash around and get more bases quicker. So it's a it's super, super awkward position to be in. What I found interesting about the dumps, though, is... They weren't the typical four minutes left of the game than dump. A lot of the time there was actually safely enough time for the teams to get their bases. So is that what you guys saw? Like a lot of the time I'd see them do it around the five, six minute mark when there was easily time to get to cycle the bases without having to 
fight for them. And that's typically what the strategy has relied on in the past, is that the, the teams would have to fight for that base. But the Spartans were straight up, from what I saw, going earlier than that and going, we don't care if you get the 10 of our bases. We just want to get our bases. I don't know. Were you seeing them the last few minute dumps or the mid game dumps? So in, in that game that we played, it was relatively early. Maybe yeah. with, you know... The, after the first third had concluded mm. um but i guess what's difficult is i don't know it's, it's like i was saying before like the the chaos is the, the 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 dump is so chaotic the pressure of like this is a golden game um i feel like teams weren't from memory i feel like catalyst and aftershock didn't cycle the empty very efficiently and we did end up fighting it oh every now God. and then <laughs> <laughs> and then i think they were able to build up heaps of momentum because neither of our bases were were getting set up in time mm. um you know it might be like so spartans get our base they go to catalyst base and we go okay we're going to get our empty and we're going to field point and then maybe we get our empty we set up in field point positions but they were getting the next base so quickly that like we and we also just weren't setting up in time properly um realistically well, like we were red we should have just had one in the sandwich one in the v and just completely locked it out but i don't remember an, a time where we ended up doing that um that was something i, I noticed when i watched our game back it's like man we we never locked two in the base and just like completely shut them out they just kind of every time they'd like just caught us out and i think a bit of that was also they might send someone like early to our base to kind of disrupt so like they're about to get their base one or two of them maybe go to our base early which kind of disrupted stuff as we're trying to like crunch back mm. um and then yeah i don't know but it, it was definitely like after the first third and then they did it but i think the, the 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 cycling of the dump wasn't super efficient um and then yeah the i can't speak to waxes in the chat i think he can maybe talk about how they were getting through the catalyst base quick as well but um we just weren't crunching quick enough and they were doing stuff like sending people early to disrupt it Yeah, I actually, um, this whole late game dumping thing, I actually, like, I know that they were doing it mid game, but <clears throat> let's say second half game dumping. I'm actually wondering whether this is going to be the next evolution of what we see uh, in the top tier teams in terms of like the evolution of strategy. Um, because like you were saying before, Ryan, it puts you on in that, that last four minutes, in that last four minutes, if a team dumps, it puts one of the teams in a very, very awkward position. Um, the one that doesn't have the empty, the empty, or has to, to choose, am I going to defend this team out or am I going to go fight for the empty? Um, I have to I have to make a decision. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah, it asks questions of uh, a team's strategical nous and their decision-making. And I think uh, at that at that top level, uh, that's what you're aiming to do, right? You're trying to ask questions in all areas of the, all facets of the game, um, including that one. So... I uh, just see it as a something I saw this year as a, a way that the top end teams could try and gain a strategical advantage on each other is by playing that last few minutes better than other teams in dump situations. Um, but that aside, I think um, like that Cascade Two performance from Spartans I thought was one of the best Cascade Two performances I've seen, especially from a visiting team with a really really strong home team. Um, like to have the courage to like kind of try to shift the meta um because they started doing it in the second cascade i'm pretty sure mm. and they and they beat you got beat the vikings in that, <laughs> yeah. in that game that, that, yeah that, yeah the game where everyone's like oh my freaking god what just yeah. happened like this it just blew everything up yeah. um yeah and then they continued to have success with it and i thought oh that was it took a lot of balls to make a big call like to shift your whole team strategy at that point of the tournament to try and do something different um mm. So yeah, I really uh, hats off to Cairns and the team for, for choosing to do that because I think what they were seeing is that if they pl just played games out in the old fashioned way, they weren't going to win this tournament. Um, yeah, that was, that was so they had to do something, um, and the fact that they did it in the grand final and it didn't work, I kind of forgive them for it because the same rules applied. If they had have played the games out normally, I know you would have loved to have seen how close they would have got um, for your own personal satisfaction. Right, but I think they probably knew oh, in their heart of hearts yeah. that it wasn't going to be enough to beat you guys. Um, yeah, and I, and I stand by it was 100% the right thing to do to switch up that strategy. It's just it, it it's just a, a strategy that will only work for so long. So yeah, yeah. like like that. Um, 
uh, the, they 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 got us really good in Cascade too. Like they they did it to us, and we weren't ready for it. And it, it was like, <laughs> okay, this is what they're doing. Um, and what like watched it back and went, okay, this is what they're doing. Um, the mistakes we made because we didn't know it was coming was here and here and here. Uh, so by the next day, we knew how to not let them get away with it. But yeah, it it was it was a very good call to switch it up to that 100%. Yeah, and maybe they went too early, but who knows? You know. Like, uh, you, I you mean, you got to try a Vicascade too. You do not want to be switching it up like that. In the grand I, I think it was a good call. You do not yeah, want to yeah. be like, hey guys, I got a great new strategy for for ascensions. <laughs> Rampage. No, no. <laughs> um, so we've kind of talked a bit about, you know, like the 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 the, the dump strategy they were doing by the end of it. Um, is there any particular weaknesses that you guys exploited in that in that grand final run that you would I, like to allude on? I would say we never fought for those dumb bases. Um, like, it, I I hate fighting for dumb base with a passion. So every time they dumped, I went catalyst. You guys have it first. I'll get it second. Uh, sometimes it was a dicey call to do that. Like the last um finals game for example i think leper got it with 40 seconds to spare and then i got it with 10 seconds to spare because i really did go catalyst i want you guys to have it so we can cycle it for free both of us because i refuse to fight for a dump base if there's physically time in the game to not not have to so leaving that time when teams are actually going to exploit that time does hurt and it's really um i think i mean in the dump most of the time the bases were clean but in the grand finals they weren't clean at all because the players weren't able to all stay up while the base was going down which meant it kind of exploded that phases were out all that sort of stuff while shooting bases um kind of the defensive players are less familiar with defending the door while they take the base so when they dumped they would get denied a lot more than they might have otherwise done earlier in the competition so yeah um a few small things but I, yeah it's awkward when you go i'm gonna let that team cycle the base first and then they go i'm gonna let that team cycle the base yeah first. yeah it's like mm. no, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a really tough call to make and i think it exploit the strategy exploited that so well was the fact that cans was like we can go earlier than teams have in the past because it's the strategy has been around for a while like it's gone by like names like ta smash and stuff where they do it towards the end of the game to ensure that they don't have the time but i'm not sure i i'm guessing it was a conscious decision because it was cans but going i think we can do it earlier give ourselves more times to get bases and they'll still be fighting for it um which <laughs> yeah it, it it you gotta get very unlucky for teams to both have a common goal and the the calmness to not fight each other for it so i think it does work well to exploit when teams are willing to be exploited for it i think they got away with um doing the earlier dumps too just because of the strength of their team mm. um yeah the, 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 across the like you were saying earlier homes you you to be able to execute you kind of like consistently you need strong players who can crack bases and you know have to be really well organized and everything and they just they tick all those boxes so they're able to do it but then, like you said, run in the big game when it, you guys were prepped for it, it uh, didn't quite play out the same way. Cool, cool. Um, who's your standout player for the team, guys? I'll let you go first, run. I'd actually say Potato. Um, I think Potato gave me the most grief out of their team. He was very good with his movement as he often is but he was like drop shunning on panels and stuff which not many people are doing these days um and really really working hard for those kills so I, I thought he was quite effective in his playing through doing through putting in so much effort to get those kills what's up uh i'll have to say peregrine um i really feel like he is like obviously he's amongst a group of like the top players or whatever but i actually think he's like on the cusp, if not already, going into the elite group uh, in terms of how he's playing. Uh, it might not show up in his stats that much because he's playing a lot of last line, but uh, just his around the arena work, his panel work, he's, he's obviously a very, very good last line. And now he's been playing for, you know, he's, what, six, seven years or whatever. 
ever. He's getting to that point where he's got a lot of experience and um, just in-game decision making and everything's going to that elite level as well. So I actually expect to, if he keeps training hard, um, I really hope to see him, yeah, bust into some serious trophy winning years over the next few years if he keeps it up. I mean, yeah, they got, well, like second in doubles, right? Paragon and Potato. Um, let's did. have a look. They yeah. did. Well done. Um, for me, it's probably probably um, Peregrine as well. Um, just because I feel like we didn't actually verse the Spartans very much, which is crazy. I think we just like just happened to like miss them. But um, I distinctly remember Peregrine being a absolute pain in the ass to get out of green base. Um, so purely for that, you know. Fuggin and you know talking about Fuggin and I had like a really really good synergy and we had <clears throat> I reckon yeah we had one of the best two 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 man attacks of the whole comp but we couldn't get this bloody guy out of green. Um, <laughs> it was him and Whippet. Him and Whippet gave me the most bloody strife. I swear to God. Um, but yeah, I think purely purely for that I actually don't remember versing the much outside of that. Obviously there was that dump game, but then it was like there's just Spartans running around everywhere. I was like. It's not, oh, that's that player. Like, oh, there's a Spartan. Oh, there's a Spartan. Um, anyway. Um, have we got any closing thoughts for the Spartans before we move on to number two? I don't think so. It's very funny that they, they were a, a, a team historically so against dumping. Got <laughs> <the fighters> with <laughs> it. And, uh, definitely isn't against winning, though. I can yeah, I know. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I guess the only final thing to say is um, I think Kansas tag ratio, he's a, a symptom of a little bit about the style of the way he runs the team. And I noticed there was like, he's obviously an excellent player, but there were some games where he got like kind of hurt, like 60, 70% tag ratio. Every, just mm. every now and then he'd have one, mm. which I think is why he's got a 0.94 because he just have the re oddest odd game where he'd have a like a really bad game. Uh, and I, yeah, I just, I think if there is any small evolution in their game, it would just be um, requiring more from the rest of the team in terms of in-game decision-making in, in the moment. Because that Kansas are very much, mm. um, first minute or two, he goes out, does a lap of the arena, susses out how everything's happening, reports back to the team, and then they start making moves, you know, after the first kind of opening stanza is complete. Um, yeah, and I think the, yeah, requiring more from his team in terms of um allowing them to to make like a lot of the more individual decision making rather than the decision making coming just from the the leader i know it's already happening to some degree but expanding the degree to which that happens um and, requ and requiring that just to enhance a little bit is probably one evolution for their game yeah yeah and i think um i kind of touched on that that note before when i was talking about who was i talking about Fuggin. one of the terms yes fuggin and like one of the one of the evolutions we made is um <clears throat> it's all well and good if fuggin's having a good if your if your captain's having a good game and like everything is on them like if they're you know we definitely had games in bendigo where he was like playing 40 chess and everyone's playing checkers down there and he was just like you know completely in control of the whole game but it is hard to keep that up um and it's also like you know, if that player has a bad game, then your team has a bad, a bad game. So I think, yeah, a big thing all teams should should kind of try to transition towards is if any one person on the team has a bad game, the rest of the team is kind of there to pick up the slack a little bit, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Anything else, guys? Let's go to Catalyst. Let's go. All right, we have... The uh, former, what is it now, four, five, five-time champion, if you include the Rumble. We have uh, the Catalyst Boys. We've got Grub, Wamfox, Husky, Wax, Dodge, and Lilbo. Let's see it. All right, predicted first, finish second. Run, take it away. So, oh, why does it say finish third? And it's because they were the last team to get into Ascensions. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I see. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Um, Catalyst, very, very strong players, as we all know. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. We we didn't see what we were hoping to see from this team. I, I think um, they were still, I would say, a solid step above everyone else. Um, I, I know you were talking about those sort of brackets, but so in, from our team's eyes, Catalyst was like solidly above, probably Aftershock and um, Spuns and Eclipse. I would say just from versing them, it felt like just their whole team is just so good pack on pack. It's actually insane. Um, and and yeah, they, they all work very well together. They have for a very long time. Uh, Husky's an insane anchor. I, I'm very impressed with how well he adapted to H2. He was not leaving anything open. Um, I would say he's still a bit weak on red, though. I, I think Lil Bo was the play for red base, from versing them. It felt like Husky wasn't quite as good in that base. Um, but no, very, like, green, green base, absolutely insane. Um... And blue base yield tight to the pillar, which I don't, that one I don't love as much um, because it just takes a few good dive, a, a few, a few dives and you're going to get them every time. Like when you, when you're versing a tight defense, you sh you should be working out where the sensors are and eventually getting at least that double with them. So it's, I don't know. I felt like blue base, they didn't quite work out as well as teams like Aftershock and Apex and stuff like that or Archangels, but yeah, um, I don't know, like, they're so good that, like, I can't stress enough how good they are, but, like, what we saw at pre-Nats, and we were expecting at Nats, it didn't quite come through, they, we were expecting them to only improve at Nats, and, like, be way, way scarier, but it was surprisingly similar versing them, if, in, in, in a lot of ways, it felt harder to verse them at pre-Nats, sorry, um, and I think if it kind of comes back to strategy for out, for what I saw of them at least. Um, it felt like pre nuts three they were utilizing this three man attack, which was working very effectively. They they would they just had the raw power to just send a three man through like even a five man D and they'd just get it and they they'd get it over and over and over again. But nationals, it felt like they kind of just went back to their bread and butter of a three two, which I think the game it at least in Hobart, was more complex than that, and, uh, and their two-man attack was uh, getting railed a bit. Um, and I don't... And it was kind of what we were alluding to earlier, is building up to the point that I think Wax has said it himself many a time, him and Grub aren't as synergized as other attackers were in the maze. So they weren't bouncing off each other in the way that you need a, a two-man attack to, to do to actually be able to crack through those tough defenses. Um, but yeah, that's that's mostly what I saw. I'm sure I'll come up with more thoughts as we go. That's just my initial thoughts. What's so? You got anything to add? Um, I guess like my thing about Catalyst, also uh, formerly known as Wolfpack. Uh, my comment has regularly regularly been is that, um, and this is the way we saw it playing them against them for a few years, and they're a much better team than they now than they were those years ago. But because you know. A, a team's strength is often their biggest weakness as well. And because they are so good on the packs and because they have 17 feet arms and they have the best last line we've ever seen, like they could regularly make um, strategical errors and get away with it. Mm. Uh, and I think what's happening now is that the pack is catching um, or they're more closer to the pack, the rest of the, the field than they ever have been, especially with the system change. Um, and they're going to have to take their like, like, tactics to another level in, in order to maintain their competitive advantage, I think. Um, yeah, the two-man attack thing's just not not going to... It just didn't work in this arena, as far as I saw. Um, uh, and so. do you think that's what they were doing? I, I, I've asked them so many times and I don't even know what their strategy was. I, I saw a two-man attack a lot, but that's, like, I, didn't, I, I couldn't get a strong read of what they were doing. I don't know. I, I refed the grand final um, and they appeared like um, to be playing similar to how everybody else was playing. Um, mm. So I don't, I don't think they were doing a two man attack or anything like that. They certainly okay. obviously had wax out there getting points, causing mm. disruption and taking opportunities on bases. Like every, from what I could see, every team had that player um, and you know, wax was that player for them. But yeah, uh, I guess. Um, being like having a more dynamic attack and having a third or fourth player push in just not because scrub told them but because that was the right call in that moment is that player should push up and create an opportunity on attack 
that's the next level they can go to is mm. is, is having a, a greater number of players involved in the active decision making on when to push and stuff like that on bases um, i think that's what's going to be required to um you know to win nationals going forward it's just too too competitive at the top level to not have um you know you know three four, three or four of the players being really active in the decision making process about when to push onto base and and things like that and not for it to be necessarily spoken but just to be reading each other's body's language and knowing when to push up and when to pull back essentially so i can i mean the game i i i can only really speak to the last two games we played against them the golden games um <clears throat> The first one was just kind of whack because that was the one where the Spartans did their dunk, and then that was like a obviously not a representation of how like a traditional game played. Um, but in terms of uh, the last game we played against them, I think um, they were very much leveraging the the whole. You know, they were blue, and they were very much leveraging the green is a very relatively easy base to get from blue if you set up correctly um and they were definitely they definitely were setting up and it wasn't just wax and grub that were at the base because i believe the second base that we actually dropped was wham fox and wham fox was the player that they had on that side door of blue or, or, or the, the right door whatever you want to call it um towards towards green um and so they were definitely in that game at least it looked like they were pretty much doing exactly what my like Arthur Shock was doing from blue of like you know trying to get set up on that cubby getting that pretty much almost a free tag on the backdoor defender because it was really hard to stay alive there and then making runs down that being said I feel like they made less runs uh from like sweep to like that tighter side of the door a lot of the time they came from like the the wider angle I guess but you know they were they were still they were still getting in yeah um, it feels like they didn't have the same full line that you guys had. So while they yeah. were trying to leverage that advantage, they didn't have that chain of command. It felt like you could stand in between their attack and their defense and you could shoot both of them in the back. Whereas when we versed you guys, it felt like there was a continuous line where if you try to duel one, you will get killed by the next in line on yeah. either end. Catalyst didn't quite have that. Um, yeah. I think at one point even Catalyst switched for grand finals, they switched to having two in the base. Um, a lot of the time and you, just, you can't get away with that like you're just losing way too much pack points and if you're putting two in the base it 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 cannot afford to drop and it was still dropping through that so yeah it it was it was a bit rough to see i don't know another thing i've I mentioned earlier about wham fox having a 1.2 tag ratio that was in pre-nats uh in this particular tournament you only had a 1.02 um and I actually wonder, he was very highly committed with the media team. Um, just don't know how much that affected his performance. Um, mm. Still still a very good performance, but he was uh, his tag ratio was about 20% higher at the prenat, at prenats 3. So, hard to know. Um, hey, all I can that. tell you is he played really, really, really well in that last Golden game because he got like 13k. I was going to say, reffing him, he, he didn't seem ham hampered, but like... Uh, nationals usually everyone is far more cooked than them they play like but yeah no definitely definitely yeah. like still playing amazing from what i saw there might be I mean, a bit of that but at, at, at the very least that one golden game he was he was on bloody fire that's all that matters got to play the big games well <laughs> oh, man. anyway um yeah i think yeah i mean you know kind of speaking to what Butza said, I feel like um, maybe they kind of caught on to the stuff like what Aftershock and Eclipse was doing strategically of like setting up the kind of chains and stuff, um, but maybe like a little too late so they didn't get heaps and heaps of reps mm. of it in. Um, and maybe they started off doing more with 3-2. I don't actually remember, I don't remember versing them like earlier on in the tournament, so I can't speak much to that. But um, I mean, that, that kind of lines up with what Butzer was saying and um, what I saw in um, my game and what you saw in your games as well, right? But um, outside of that, do we have any big? It's weird saying this about this this kind of a team, but uh, any any big points of improvement for the Catalyst 
boys going into um, 2024, assuming they, they're all playing still. Oh, they got to get H2 first. That's, that's <laughs> ah. no, they, they don't need it. They, I was really actually like they picked up the packs really well, I thought. They did. Um, they were yeah, great. They were excellent on the packs. I we think weren't getting just... gunshots on them or anything. They were good. Yeah, they were like outside of you guys, probably the best on the packs that mm. I that I saw. Um, but I think just more has to go into um, just more planning. Just like they've got all the skill and experience now. Um, putting a little bit more time into, I don't know, just it seemed like a strategical. Um, it was strategical. The reason they couldn't quite catch you guys um, didn't seem like they were lacking in ability or pack skill. It was just how they were setting up. Mm. Yeah. Um... Wax is still at the 1.2 denial mark as well, which is something I saw. I don't know if we should point that out. Grumped <laughs> at 1.3. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah I, I, and I think it genuinely is a lot of it is synergy. Like they've said they don't attack much together in training, you know, and like they're not at the point they have been in the past. Um, and it, yeah, it, it kind of showed like they, they weren't able to muscle their way through bases and they were dropping denials for it as well. I think that also speaks to the they don't have that third player rolling up enough mm. um, because that's how the other teams were keeping their denials down is having that third player rolling into support. Um, and if you're trying to get, down. yeah, there was too many. Like one of the things we'll talk about soon when we get to your team run is how many denials that you got on <laughs> at the opposite team's base, mm. and it goes to it goes to speaks to what you're saying about maze control. Um, there was too many random players floating around all over the shop from every team like that. You couldn't just get, rock up with two players and safely know that you're going to have a free hit at a base. Like that third player was necessary to keep the denials down um, mm. and ensure that you got bases. And I think that probably hurt them a bit as well. That's why they were, Wax and Grub were getting denied so much is just a lack of support from the third player. Yep. Um, other thing is it wasn't quite as dynamic as some of the teams. I, whenever I was versing this team, I knew exactly where that attack was by listening to Grub. Um, I, I think it's in some other teams, team, yeah, and I think I think they need to lift off some of that responsibility from Grub because yeah, he's telling them where to go at what time, and you can just listen to that and know what they're doing. Whereas, uh, and it's not as fast because he has to tell them. Um, whereas other teams, it's silent. Like t players know where to go at what point in time they know to just push themselves up to assist that attack they know uh they can just like quickly look at each other and go like attack and straight on it um maybe even just a look uh that sort of stuff they, or they see their their teammate get two kills at the base and they know i can help attack and get a base that sort of thing um so yeah i i, I think it, it, it's quite interesting what this comp showed I, I think it is weird to talk about a team like these in what well, they could improve, but I think it showed a lot of cracks this year um, that is, will finally give them something to improve on. I know it's what they've been after for so long is, is, a, is a reason to improve. So I think it's good for these guys in the long run. Yeah. Hey, uh, well, let's uh, move on and pick on our stand-up player of the team. Uh, Runt, you can go first. I gotta go with... Uh, it's tough for these guys. Um, I would say a little bit. I, I I think I think he's uh, like very impressive to be up up here. Um, and playing this well this early on into his career, and some of the shots he was hitting, like just crazy spin shots. Uh, some of the most majestical shots I, I I saw hit this comp, like the the pack skill and the aim and the H two, is very very impressive on him. Um, yeah, I, I would say a little bit. What's that? I stole mine. <laughs> uh, I I um I, I saw it in him in tra training maybe, oh, maybe three months four months before we came. I just he, he went to another level. Um, and I actually feel like Lilbo could potentially become like the strongest player on that team um now he's with a bit more time he's actually those spin moves and stuff that you were talking about like he's got he's very very fast and mm. he has this uncanny ability to track players and know who's coming up next uh, i was um, gonna bully him for that i'm not gonna lie but yes <laughs> yeah he's like he 
he's got this thing where he doesn't even need to see the player. He can yeah. kind of just sense that they're about to come and reposition himself inside the base to make sure he's not going to get shot from them mm. and get them. And anyway, he's, um, now when I say he's got the um, potential to be one of the best players on that team, I mean, he's very good in a, like a, a last line position, for example, in a confined area. I wouldn't say he's like, he's not, he's not like grub in terms of game awareness, understanding what's happening, like across the whole arena or anything like that. But you put him in a confined space and tell him to keep everybody down or defend a base. And he's like really, really, really strong. So yeah, shout out to him for getting to that level at such a early stage of his career. Yeah. Yeah. Happy days. Um, I don't know. It's hard. This is a hard team to pick a pick a pick a stand up player, huh? But um, I don't know if I can. Honestly, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Wham Fox purely for putting us in the bin in that last golden game. <laughs> um, how about that? Uh, we wouldn't have guessed that Wham Fox would be the second base that we would have dropped to the catalyst guy <laughs> you know wax and grub and then maybe they bring husky out maybe dodge gets in now when when really stepped up in that game um so because it's so hard to pick one i'm just gonna go based off of that one game and go with wham fox and like like butzer was kind of saying with all the you know the mental pressure we'd have and probably maybe even exhaustion from doing like so much for the media team as well as the media director um for him to go out and have performances like that in golden games is uh it's madness absolute madness so all right have we got any last things we'd like to say about uh catalyst before we move on to our first place team and wrap up the show oh, i just gotta quickly laugh at wax because he was before the competitions he was so so keen to tell us that we would not be able to do the same shit to them that we did to everyone else and there it is wax hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 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 just him in particular it. gotta rub it in a little bit yeah. we? he said he'll fight you <laughs> mm, interesting all right well um yeah big congrats to catalyst um i hope that they stick together in the same roster and they're able to um yeah you know i hope this there's something to be said it, it's hard to stay on top i think um, and so, and you know, to, to find, like you were saying, run over, over the course of all the pre -nets, like you guys were just like actively like, please like show us the weaknesses in our game, beat us so we can get better. Um, and you know, being a team that's won so many nationals in a row, um, I'm hoping that this will be a, you know, maybe, maybe re refreshing for them and give them a, a reason to really like, you know, head down, bum up, get your, get your training done focus on on the things you need to improve on and come back a, an even more dominant team which is just a scary thing to think about but anyway cool 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 let's move on to our last team we have the hobart vikings run cv leper karen twinkles and gandhi now that's a good looking uh that's a good looking spread <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I've got nothing else to say. What's up? All you, bro. Um, oh, well, it doesn't get any easier, really, doing a review stream of a team that hardly loses a game the whole competition. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely dominant. Um, I haven't had, a, I didn't get a chance to go through the record books, but uh, it'd have to be one of the most dominant performances we've seen from a home team. Um, I was wanting to ask you how it compares to your team in Brisbane. Uh, I, our team in Brisbane, like that was the only time I got to the end of Cascade two and said there was there was zero chances we're going to lose mm. this competition. Um, yep. that's the only ever time in my whole laser tag career I've felt that way about a comp. Um, you guys prob did you did you have a feeling like that at any at pretty much every stage of the tournament uh, <laughs> when did that kick in for you that you, that was very unlikely that you guys were going probably to probably about cascade one or so i yeah. would say yeah um yeah nah um from what i saw i think i think we dropped like five or six games and i think your record still beats ours at, at only four games dropped um over a tournament, so yeah. 
No, because the original Hobart A team only dropped one in the tournament. Oh, in yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's the era we There was only 11 teams in the tournament. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it, it was, uh, I guess, a combination of things. One, obviously, the new system was um, helpful. Uh, having somebody like yourself who's in, like, you know, your you're up in the elite group um, and you're cracking into that elite group and you're also having a system change at the same time. And also the arena played in a way where the meta was to have, you know, we, we put two players in constant points getting positions uh, that were responsible for snagging 50 to 60 tags and trying to get as big a score as possible. You put all those combinations together and you get like a runt Hobart 2023 performance. Um, <laughs> it is so rare to see stats. Can we pull the stats up? like that to see a grc of three um <laughs> from a player who's leading the attack essentially like every other player that's leading the attack for their team is getting sometimes less than one both spartans and catalyst their lead attacker was 0.94 and 0.96 um you're getting a tag ratio of 1.5 so like com like running your team at the same time so uh it was an absolutely rare performance uh yeah, it was a it was a, a joy to watch. I don't know what else to say. I mean, um, the, like if can we, you go ahead in strengths because I I don't think it's we can't talk about weaknesses yet. There was too many strengths. We need to talk about uh, too many weakness uh, strengths. Yeah, we can't talk about weaknesses yet, home. So maybe you should take over for me and talk about the things that impress you the most in uh, particularly in the in the round in the golden games in the, the games at the pointy end. Yeah, I mean. Um... So we got the opportunity to verse you guys quite a lot and you got the better of us almost every time. I think we beat you that one time when you weren't even in the game because you were a hospital. We you did beat manage, properly. We, yeah. we beat you properly once. We did get that. Yeah. That was uh, that was a feels good moment. But I think um Yeah, the reality was um I think it was off the back of your defensive setups being really really crisp and clean and very disciplined um you know blue base like stands out to me as a shining example of that with like karen in the base um just everyone it was, yeah it was it was really hard to bloody crack crack your bases uh, especially with the two i think once we brought the third out um to hit your base we would have much more success with that because it was injecting a little bit more chaos into the situation but attacking your base with only two was like impossible um so i think that was one thing i i, I know we noticed um and two obviously we were talking about you know the the two people attacks just like wasn't really working like it really was you really needed to bring that third person out whether it was like a committed attacker or just a door defender that made a blitz to push out and help you secure a base get that one tag you need to help you um and you guys were like well what if we just like don't even need to do that how about that um and yeah you guys obviously had the best um two-player attack of the of the whole tournament um you know you just yeah perfect synergy with you and twinkles you, you, you knew your your formula i guess to crack out each of the bases and you knew your little micro things to like make sure like you 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 weren't getting uh denied on those bases very much either um yeah i don't know it's like it's hard it's hard it's hard it's hard it's hard, it's hard. I, but, I think that's a significant point though that you've brought up is that you guys were the only one that could pull off a two-man attack yeah you, against anybody yeah that no. was a significant advantage it, it's something we've been discussing the whole time but i really do believe the synergy between myself and twinkles is insane <laughs> like like such a vital part yeah no it, it actually blew my mind playing nationals with him because the synergy i have with him is is far beyond what i could have ever imagined it it is just the other night we were training and there was like a a four person setup and we just like exact perfect moves to bounce off each other and and pins every single one of them so they had two guns on them at all times yeah just the synergy that's there it, it, it's it's amazing and i i enjoy playing with him so so much because of it I think there's a um, there's a skill that I like to mention to new players to learn, which is learn how to dominate. Which is like when you're winning your standoffs, there's actually a skill in knowing how to maximise the return you get from being on, so to speak. 
Uh, and I feel like, yeah, you guys were just like a perfect example of that. Like you had the slight advantage of having the packs um, and you're a little bit better on the packs, but you fully maximized the um, benefit that was gained from being marginally better on the packs than everyone else. Um, yeah, and they just noticed it in the around, around the arena. Like, if the, the, only a, a tiny little window would have to open up in terms of a, a mis defensive mistake or something like that, and um, you guys would take full advantage of it and, and have the base. And no other teams were really doing that. Um, something I did want to ask, but sir, you said our maze kind of informed how we played in other mazes. Did you want to elaborate on that? Because I. I... I love. I, I completely agree with you, but I haven't heard your thoughts on how it affects our gameplay. Okay, so the best example I can give is when um, we played in Adelaide 2017. Um, and the way you guys would set up would always be a little bit further from the doors than what we, would, we were doing and what we'd expect teams to be doing. And we're like, why are they playing so far from the doors? Um, and like, we could never quite kind of figure it out. And then when we get to this arena, we realized it's so arena dependent like in hobart you tend especially like green's a perfect example right you tend to uh you're not setting up on the doorway like trying to dive directly in you're actually setting up meters back from the doorway getting the correct tags and then sprinting in uh and it's just so, for me that kind of made sense oh this is why they this is why we've noticed them not be as aggressive on the doors as you would expect, particularly in Queensland arenas. Like this is why Queenslanders love to queue up at doors <laughs> and sunny coast of Brisbane. That's what you're doing. Like you're queuing up at a, at a door pretty much, um, you know, not, not, you know, not directly, but pretty close to the door. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the main thing. Just how you guys set up for base. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I think when I think about, you guys attacking us as well when I was in the defense is, yeah, you definitely, when Putza says it that way, it makes a little sense. The Queenslanders like to kind of set up on the doors, win their duels there, and then go in. But um, when you guys, when Tw you and Twinkles were attacking us, it was like on the fringes, you get your couple tags, and then suddenly you're, 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 you're on the doors. But then the door defenders have been tagged, and then it's two of you versus like one last line. And realistically, like the last line's not supposed to win. Mm. Um, those situations um i guess that was a that's a yeah a big thing as well it's just you obviously it's easy to talk about um your ability to crack the last line out of her position but i feel like the what the 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 prerequisite of that is dealing with the door defenders quickly and efficiently and not having those like grueling like just you know dueling on a dueling on a door doubling a bunch um yeah because uh, every time you got into our base it wasn't you know maybe there was a, from memory it was the only times you got in was when both of our door defenders died and then it was mm. just like a perfect pin set up it was like the last line's like oh well buddy, i give up <laughs> you guys suck on the outside you suck yeah. that's your fault <laughs> <sighs> um yeah and i think a, a mistake that i actually see a lot of people make is um and another thing that i think you guys did really well was let's say you're out on the doors let's say runt wins his duel twinkles doubles in in their duel rather than runt trying to force an opportunity maybe i'm sure you did sometimes but at least when you were attacking us it felt like you wouldn't just like force an opportunity you would take your time and wait mm. win your duel again and if twinkles won his duel then then you set up your thing and I think that's a that's a big thing that I, I see a lot. Um, it's particularly punishing on trigger lockout. Um, this is, I like I, I talk to my, um, you know, it's something I bring up a lot at home because we play on Nexus with trigger lockout. Because um, if you, it's so hard to win your duel sometimes, um, especially with trigger lockout. But whatever, if you win your duel and they double, if you just decide to like lunge in, you're basically just like ruining. You're just wasting that that effort that you put into winning that duel in the first place. I guess it speaks a little bit to what, what Putza was saying as well, is like learn to dominate. Like if you win your duel and your other person doubles or loses their duel, don't just like throw your life away and just like, oh, I'm just going to try lunge at base anyway and see what happens. Like take your time. You can just like sit around for a few seconds, get another 150 points off of this person and then try again. Mm. Um, is that a is that an accurate assessment that you guys would 
Yeah, like, yeah. I, I'd say, I I'd say in ninety percent of circumstances, if you have an opportunity to take it, the the times when I do that is when I know I'm the last line is good enough that it is a 100% death for me or like a 95% yeah. death for me um, and your team was a team that had an, uh, an anchor good enough to, to stop that so I really there, there was literally no and like I tried many times before that of trying to force that opportunity but in against those high tier teams with those like anchors that aren't gonna stick out their gun or anything you you gotta play play for both sides um, which is Hard to do, but yeah. Uh, um, yep. I was gonna say, why don't you tell us what your big, what you thought your biggest strengths were in your own arena? Yeah. In, in um, it's interesting. Um, I think a lot of our win was chalked up to home side advantage and packs, and there's certainly elements. And I've always said that I'm more keen to to play in another arena than a home arena but i think there were a lot of key elements that got us over the line um that were sort of isolated from all that stuff like <laughs> when hobart team started to do to do well in uh in like ascensions and stuff players were like oh the home side advantage has gotten stronger i was like what are you <laughs> talking about that does not make any sense it's actually insane um i think i think a big one is strategy um i think we got better throughout the competition because our strategy plays to the highest tier games of those lockdown games where you're playing for points. And when you're playing for points, you really want to have both sides capitalizing on points. So being pushed out both sides, no matter which base you're on, uh, playing that blue to red stretch, even though it's harder to force kills there and you have to work harder for kills, it's still worth doing to keep both teams ticking over. Like Catalyst got pretty much starved out of their game, their finals game on green, because Spartans and us were taking over kills on on the blue red stretch. Um, so it's macro game stuff like that, and um, I think our strategy, nobody else really tried it except for Storm, and 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 they were one of the hardest teams to burst because of it. Because I think we showed a strategy that worked for the maze, and nobody else really tried to do it like us and in a sense maybe they never would have been better than us at our own strategy so maybe it was never worth doing but yeah and it felt a lot like other teams wouldn't counter us either so we'd just win on strategy without even having to change much like finals catalyst and spartans played perfectly into our hands like they just did like they they, they played a slow game to us with, with like one or two men attacks so it was like yeah obviously we're gonna win these and they switched to a dump and we just collapsed back in it was like yeah this is playing to us um so I, I think most of our win was strategic um it helps a lot that the strategy for this arena is so perfect for our team's makeup um you have two designated bro uh like door defenders and two designated points and attackers that never have to actually swap over if you play the strategy for full maze control, which that suits us perfectly um, because CV and Leper, some of the best on doors there are. I think I uh, just want to quickly highlight Leper's another one that got that 1.23 tag ratio standing on a door, which is insanity. He played out of his mind this comp and it, he forces the attackers into the last line as well. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, it uh, frees myself and twinkles up to score those points um, and shut down the game. I think um, where we differed from Storm was our ability to actually control the game. Um, so where Storm would control a lot of the maze, we would stop other teams from getting any bases whatsoever. Um, and yeah, to me, it felt like our, our team was at a point where it was so dynamic that everything we didn't have to talk much at all um a lot of our two men attacks were just a solo player being backed up by a defender um because when you play for maze control all it takes is sometimes the effect isn't even seen all it takes is defenders to control those positions and restrict where the defenders of the base can stand to line up a sink where you can solo base even if you don't, defenders don't even have to shoot someone if they just control some of the space and restrict sight lines. It's very, it, it, it's surprisingly easy to solo a base when they're restricted to areas they can stand. So um, a lot, of, a lot of 
us soloing bases was on the back of maze control essentially um it's just restricting the other teams and and dominating but but yeah two-thirds because it's a triangle if you can dominate two-thirds you're in a pretty good spot um but like we we had weaknesses um if teams actually played strategies that counted us and punished us for pushing out uh apex did it perfectly they they just got the other base really well and collapsed back in with five against us and that was one of our hardest games where we we lost strategically and had to muscle our way through there weren't many games we lost strategically i feel some of them were i would say apex maybe eclipse maybe um aftershock would be the ones we lost strategically to but that's why the finals felt so anticlimactic for us i would say is because they played they played to us which was weird to me um yeah uh we also did it without Owen, which like, yeah, if, if home side advantage is a thing, being down a player who is having an amazing comp does sort of negate that. But anyway, mm -hmm. I, I think there is perhaps some more credit in different places than wh where people were putting the credit. Uh, um, I'm curious to know, are you uh, interested in sharing the, I heard whispers of it, but sharing this, the, the strategy? Like in, an, in another um, yeah. bit of content at some stage. Yeah, um, I mean, like I'm definitely down for a finals breakdown. Like I, I mean, I I I I I literally like tell people our strategy all the time because I'm like they're gonna work it out by three pre nuts and a nationals, right? 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 Like surely. But... I think it's, it's there's so much happening, and I like I mean, you think that everybody's just gonna know exactly how you play, but. Yeah. It, it's it's impossible to know every part of it so i think mm. that's why it's such a interesting thing is to go okay well there's the benchmark strategically how, how did we stack up i think that would be such a valuable bit of content for people to get their ears on yeah um so yeah like i'm definitely happy to break it down um especially since like a lot of it will be hobart dependent anyway so well i think we had a lot of strengths um and i think our win was like as we were saying earlier is like similar to the dominance of maroons i don't know if it'll be as effective in aubrey like i'm not just saying we're gonna win aubrey like based on this but yeah it it felt dominant a lot to strategy and how well it fit us and not not really being counted yeah i think um like, i mean if we're gonna if we transition into like the opportunities for you guys um like for me, it's all about, can you do it away from home for you guys now? Mm. Like, can you back it up next year? Yeah. Um, and do you have the depth on your team to be able to do it in a foreign arena? Cause they're not all gonna play mm. like Hobart. Yeah. Um, and no doubt you guys are setting that challenge internally as well, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of the reason we developed the strategy was to account for depth and our attack depth and our, does it, it doesn't go all the way down so can we develop a strategy where we can exclusively play to our team strengths and that's what it felt like we were able to do this year and the looks of Aubrey might be able to do it again but I'm not sure you're gonna have a pretty good chance because um the chance there's not going to be a h2 site in Queensland I don't think before Aubrey um yeah if there is that'll be we would only have the packs for a short amount of time so you guys have got this rare opportunity where you're going to be like one of the only sites in australia to have the the packs two years in a row mm. um and you've got all this young talent coming through um at your local like you got you guys got probably choices to make for this year as well i'm guessing in terms of who's going to make the vikings team yeah you've got definitely so new talent so yeah i'm predicting it could actually be a little bit of a um a, a good really solid chance for, to go back to back next year for you guys yeah well moving on <laughs> Let's pick our uh, standout player. Um, well, there's an easy, obvious pick. Uh, about as easy and obvious as it gets. But take it, I am, take it, Holmes. I am going to shout out Lepa because as um, Runt was saying, or what I was saying before, is it felt impossible to attack the Vikings base with just two people. And a lot of that, and as I was talking before about like why um, Runt and Twinkle's attack was so effective is because for you to get into a good three player defense, you need to kill both of the door defenders. You can't, you can't, and you can't, well, yeah, you can't, you need to, you need to get both the door defenders out. 
and then it needs to be a two on one on the last line because if it's a last line and it's a one on one, the last line if they're good are going to win that ninety five hundred percent of the time, right? And um, yeah, Leper made it. Uh, I think I personally think he had like the best timing of the whole tournament. Um, <laughs> That's what it seemed like. Maybe he just had my number, but I felt like he had the best timing in the tournament and uh, made it extremely difficult to ever have, have both like myself and uh, Fuggin usually um, active at the same same time. Um, so big shout out to Leper for, for, for that. Obviously, you know, the defenders and the people that don't get the big stats don't often get the shine, but um, definitely got to give some credit there. But um, yeah, I don't know. Runt as well gets a special mention, I guess, for having the probably the most dominant individual performance we've ever seen in a in a tournament ever. So, good job. Thank you. Nice work. What's <laughs> up? Oh. <laughs> all you? Yeah, well, I, I was going to say Runt and Leper as well. Um, stole them again. Uh, but Leper for me, probably you know, for, for a big part of his career probably one of the most underestimated players in the competition. Um, certainly this year, because there's a lot of like new players that don't know him from the old <laughs> days. Uh, but yeah, Leper in his day was, um, you know, uh, would have been on the, an Australian team. If Australian team was picked, it was, it was a five year period where he would have been an all Australian defender for sure. Um, and he proved um, in this comp that he's still, still there. Uh, so yeah, that was that was super impressive that um, he still uh, still can play at that level. Um, and yeah, uh, I've never seen anybody perform as strongly as you did in this comp run um, at a tournament before. Uh, I'd certainly think the arena was like helps you fully like let that out. Like you, it was for a player to do those kinds of stats at a at a previous tournament, they would have been having to do something that's very un team team oriented. <laughs> But that was part of the strategy in this arena is that you needed somebody on your team dominating and controlling the arena the way you were doing it. So you were completely playing within the team paradigm um, and captaining the team. Uh, and, you know, that's really incredible that we now have that as a benchmark um, for future years, pretty much. Uh, messed up, bro. It's messed up. It is messed up. Totally messed up. But he didn't get 100 tags. But so. I did not get 100, 100 tags. Yeah. I wanted it to do it in a different arena anyway. I'm, I'm, I've got my sights on over uh, <laughs> I ref that game. You got 99, actually. I was standing yeah. up green, and I've never heard so many dings in a short amount of time. <laughs> so you were not green, and you no. came in and stood inside green and were throwing shots outside through the sweep without even looking, just knowing that people are always queued up there. And all I could hear was ding, 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 And you're not even yeah. looking where you're shooting. It was, nah. uh, I was like, whoa, that's next level, that is. Yeah, that's nah. uh, people still don't understand. Uh, most of the points you get in the game, like if, if you want a lot of points, you, you hold the other team's base. Uh, <laughs> and it felt like Twinkles and myself were the only ones that were really doing it this comp. But yeah, very fun to do. I started doing it a little bit. If I got green, I'd stay in there for as mm. long as I could, but it was only towards the end. I didn't get enough practice in there, but it, it was pretty fun because you got that like um, almost like reckless abandon where you're like, well, I'm just not going to be any teammates mm. on the outside. You can kind of just plug shots. Uh, I kept shooting George for that exact reason, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually, it actually reminded me of um, 2017 Adelaide Nuts. Um, those bases, particularly red, just because it was like mirrored and like the way the angles worked out it was a, i guess a similar feel to like the green tea where you got the ball and then you got two mm. audi bits um these ones were half height so you kind of had to stay super low but i mean you did it super low anyway but yeah if you got into the base and you got it you know like well i'm not gonna be shooting teammates probably unless you're the other person's hanging around and you would just go like bang 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 yeah. bang, bang until you run out of power and then you run out of power and you're like right, i've had i've had my funnel go now yeah. You can also be slightly braver than an anchor is allowed to be because there's less consequences for dying. So you can really do those offensive defense of yeah. another base, which they really hate to deal with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, you've set a trend. Now, attackers are never going to leave bases. They're just going to stay there and keep yeah, like going. Sure yeah. it, it? <laughs> yeah. I'm going I'm to try that out on training on Monday, I reckon. <laughs> All right, have we got anything else we would like to say about the Hobart Vikings before we wrap up the show? Oh, look, I didn't get to pick a standout. I'd, I'd just yeah, like to say um, 
Gandhi, Gandhi was having an amazing tournament. He was playing so bloody well. Like, he stepped up his game at pre nats 3 so hard, and then he stepped it up even further for Nationals. Like, yeah, it, it, it felt like he was well up in... The way he was playing was up in the crowd of, like, the top-tier teams in a way he never had been before. Um... And then he got injured, <laughs> and, and it was really rough to see see that that change. But yeah, um, I I I think it would have been even more dominant if he was there. And in in my mind, that kind of adjusts for the packs. But yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how it goes next year. Did you have Gandhi and Karen playing only last line, or were they pl also playing other roles as well? No, nah, so we'd often suit. Lepra or Sid CV and um, Gandhi or usually Gandhi would play the door and sort of take that that pushing role to assist the attack. And Gandhi was very, very good at soloing, soloing bases on defense, <laughs> um, which was yeah hilarious because we'd always come back to check how, how our defense is going and he'd tell us we had one. And it's like, I don't know how the hell you did that, but thank you. So yeah, uh, Gandhi was playing amazing and it was very sad to lose that for the final day. It surprised me how few denials he got only 0.08 which means that he, nobody was getting into the base <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he was great in there he was yeah. amazing oh. yeah especially red freaking hell yeah red, red. so yeah. good at red all right gentlemen i think uh if we're all done we'll go to this last slide here that's just uh you know the full the full story the full picture <clears throat> gaze upon that for a moment but um do either of you have anything you would like to close up the show with? Um, anything you'd like to say? Um... I, I just really hope Aubrey, th this review has been really fun for me because every team did something so different. It, it was such a varied meta. There was, there was so, so much difference between teams and they felt like they had such a strong identity in the way that we've never seen before. I think where every team plays a 4-1 or every team plays a 3-2. Um, and it's, yeah, it's it's becoming a more dynamic game this year, it, far more than previous. So I really hope we see that trend continue in Aubrey. I really hope the maze design pushes the dynamic play. Yeah, 100%. It uh, keeps it refreshing, huh? Mm. I think um, any sport I've ever followed, whenever like the, 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 the meta just kind of stagnates for a while and it's just like the same same old stuff like the depth of the strategy because you're doing the same thing gets like obviously you can you can get really really in depth with it if you're doing everyone's doing the same strategy but i don't know it's just it's just way more fun and refreshing if people are doing different stuff right and i guess that's one of the advantages of laser 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 sports in general especially our team game is there's three teams in the arena and the arenas are all different um the bases themselves are different. Uh, it's part of what makes uh, this sport really, really special, I think. It's just, um, yeah, so many things can change. And it's, uh, often the, the best teams are the ones that adjust the best. Um, yeah. Anything else to say, gentlemen? Oh, just to, just to uh, back up Runt's point, I think it's uh, credit to the arena design as well. I think I felt like mm. that played a huge a part in it. Um, the size, I think it's a real lesson for us in terms of like, for me, anyway, it was like the perfect size arena. Like <laughs> small, small arena, kind of small. Um, but you need to have enough of a break between the bases that anybody pushing out to support the attack is can you know defenders can get behind them. Like you have to make it not too easy just to take one step out of your base and be supporting the attack. There needs to be a bit of challenge to that. And I felt like Hobart just it was just the right size. I know that's so not like. Uh, anything you influence because you just get given the space that you've got but um the bases were even like you could win from all the three all three colors um and that and all of those factors combined meant that we had this big variety of strategy like you said run so it's a great uh great tournament and um uh, well really well hosted uh, i love the gift packs that you gave to the international team so that was a nice touch um trophies were excellent as well i might add very good choice uh and um uh, yeah big thanks to also zoltac for inviting us the laser sports academy to be on really 
um, grateful to the, to the Zeltac guys for that. Um, yeah, that's all my final words, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll echo that a bit. Um, obviously, we've got these really wicked graphics. We've got these player cards. Yeah. Um, we've got these animations and stuff. All these cool things happen in the background. Um, none of this would have been possible without the uh, collaboration with uh, Zoltak and the, the media team. So big, big thanks to them for allowing us to have this opportunity. Um, this is kind of the last Zoltak LSA thing we've got in plan in the books for the short term. But rest assured, um, you know, there's there's a lot a lot to be to be had, but from from this relationship between us and Zoltak. So um, stay tuned and uh, yeah, you know, let's. Uh, that's whoa! I don't know. Woo. Hey, let's tag. You get the thing. Let's tag. No, cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Um, before we finish, I want you guys to guess without looking at the time. If you've already looked, then you smell. But guess how long we've been running for. I feel like we got like three fifty. Someone's someone said we were like three and a half at Vikings. So I feel like we're three fifty ish. So uh three and a half hours three hours 55 minutes Whoa. sorry almost four hours <laughs> yeah the two and a half hours we predicted or whatever it was oh, no, it <laughs> it's the only opportunity we got to do it justice right true right. all right let's uh let's go to bed i'm falling asleep <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks for tuning right. in everybody yes thank you very much butzer thank you run um, and thank you to everyone that's been engaging in the chat and stuff and all people that are going to rewatch the VOD. Um, have an excellent night. Good luck with your trainings. Stay tuned for more Laser Sports Academy content coming your way. Uh, transitioning to offline screen now. 